Aloha and happy Halloween. I'm Jay Dreamers. Welcome to my channel. Today's Truth and Movies. What better movie to do on Halloween than one of the best and ultimate Halloween movies of all time? One of my personal favorites, Donnie Darko. So I would like to say hello, happy holidays to everybody in the chat, or if you don't celebrate, just hi. <laughs> um, man, what a great great movie. I can't believe we haven't broken this one down, but a lot of people have been requesting it and I thought it was a great idea. So you may have heard a lot of, uh, this is, this is a cult classic, right? And there's a lot of videos out there where people are, uh, are basically trying to break down and figure out this movie because there's so much to try to figure out. There's so much esoteric symbolism packed into this movie. I hope you're in for, I hope you're ready for a ride. We're going to take a ride on the wild side. Let's leave the world of the boring behind for a little while, yeah? Let's jump right into Donnie Darko. Uh, this movie's about time travel, it's about uh, anomalies, it's about the apocalypse, which is right up my alley. So let's jump right into it and see what we've got. Donnie Darko starts off, uh, it's presented by a company called Pandora, which is really interesting because if you've researched uh, Pandora or Pandora's box, then what you'll find out is that there was uh, some myths and some legends a long time ago that talked about how uh, the gods had actually presented uh, a gift to mankind in the form of a, a female that they have created out of mud or clay. And then uh, they gave her a box and they said, don't open it. And they actually gave her husband the keys to the box. Well, curiosity got the best of her. And when she opened up that container, which is just another word for box or box is another word for container, right? It doesn't have to be a cube or anything. Um, when she opened that up, that's when all of the world's problems, all of the trials and tribulations, all of the evils that you see in this world today right? All of the negativity, the hatred, the fear, the anger, uh, all of that stuff was released into our world. The only thing that was kept um, alive in and stayed in the box was hope. So that's very much appropriate for this movie because we want to keep hope alive when we live in a world that's messed up, torn apart, upside down, and the reverse of what it should be um, it goes against our vibrations. A lot of us truth seekers out there, a lot of us who have the energy of, of love or what I call the blue beam light or the light inside. So we start the movie off presented by Pandora and we see that somebody's lying in a road somewhere. We get a little bit closer and we find out it's Donnie Darko. Donnie was sleeping on the road. He is actually a sleepwalker and we're going to get to uh, the sleepwalking stuff here in a bit, but he wakes up, looks out and we have the intro. Donnie, Darko. And then all of a sudden we have this flash in the sky at the very beginning, right, right there in the, in the skyline. It's not the sun or anything. It just kind of flashes. That flash is really important to the movie too. We'll talk about that here in a minute. So as we start off, there's a moon. I mean, that's not, not a moon. There's a song that's playing and I like to watch the movies with the uh, captioning on. It says, under blue moon, I saw you. And if you've watched my channel long enough, you've seen that the blue moon symbolism is the once in a blue moon. I'm not talking about the blue moon that the news comes out and says, oh, tonight's going to be a blue moon. It's really not blue. You know what I mean? There is a time that comes just before the apocalypse when the moon turns blue, as does the sun. Um, and I've got quite a few videos I've done about that, but it's basically an omen of the apocalypse is the blue moon. That's why, that's why it's once in a blue moon hardly ever happens. It's once every age, once every eon, and it happens just before the apocalypse, which is what we're about to see. So we go to the town of Middlesex, and as you can see, it's Halloween Eve or All Hallows Eve, which we just broke down in one of my recent, um, live streams about, um, when we talked about Attack of the Killer Tomatoes and the blob. So we broke down Halloween, All Hallows Eve in that, in that video. Let's take a look at this town's name, Middlesex. That's kind of weird, right? Um, let's find out what Middlesex refers to. It says here, if we look up the etymology of the word, literally land of the Middle Saxons or between Essex and Wessex, right? So there is a land called Essex and Wessex. So the Middle Saxons is where we are right now in the movie. So let's figure out what Saxon means, right? If we take a closer look, basically we see that the word relates to and means something along the lines of a knife, a sword, 
or a dagger, which is appropriate. So we're in a place where the middle sword is, or the middle knife, as you could say, right? That is the sword of Excalibur. When we talk about the apocalypse and we talk about sword symbol symbolism, it's Excalibur, which we also broke down the meaning of that in our Monty Python Truth in Movies. So the middle sword, what what is that about, the middle sword? Well, this is going to come into play, okay? Remember, Halloween, or All Hallows' Eve, has a lot of direct correlations to Christmas and the birth of Jesus and the birth of the light into the world, right? So here we have the traditional three crosses. Jesus would be in the middle. And then biblically speaking, he was uh, he was uh, hung up there with two other criminals or people who were accused of being criminals. One criminal was said to be evil and the other one was said to have a change of heart, basically. So on one side... Of this middle pillar, we've got a positive, and on the other side, we've got a negative, or an anode and a cathode, with uh, the middle pillar uh, being the light of the world, the middle pillar that shoots up out of Mount Maru, which is a huge symbolism, right? We're going to talk about Mount Maru and the symbolic imagery there, too. I drew some little plasma volcanoes underneath it. You'll have to excuse my crude drawings here, but we zoom in on Donnie Darko's house. His dad's out mowing the lawn or blowing the leaves around. His mom's reading a book. Check this book out. It's Stephen King's It, which is about uh, the clown Pennywise, which really he's a shapeshifter. Pennywise is a shapeshifter and he comes from space. His true form is closer to that of a spider or a crab or what I call a phantazoid, which is an otherworldly space creature, right? But really he represents plasma. Plasma is the ultimate shapeshifter. And during the apocalypse, or symbolically, um, apocalyptically, we're, we're, we're talking about good versus evil. Energy, good energy, positive energy, energy that gives, and evil energy, or selfish energy, or energy that takes. We're talking about the givers and the takers, and that's what she's reading up on right now. So automatically, they're giving us a lot of context for what the movie is really going to be talking about. So they're all having dinner one night, and uh, Donnie, Donnie starts talking to his sister because they're talking about when she can have babies and stuff. She, he says, not until the eighth grade. I only took a picture of that because of the, the number eight. The number eight is going to pop up a lot in this movie. We have broken it down, but we're going to come back to the number eight and why it's uh, so important symbolically speaking when it comes to the middle of the world. Hey, thanks for the donation, Hamad or Hamed. Appreciate you. All right. Now we zoom in on Donnie. This is Donnie's bedroom. Let's check it out. Immediately, we see some symbolism. He has this huge eyeball on the wall. This is symbolic of the eye in the sky, the eye that opens up um, when the world goes through a depressurization event and the atmosphere itself depressurizes. The sky opens and the world depressurizes. Things get sucked up into the air and monsters are in introduced to our world. Other worldly creatures enter in and float down into our world. Other, other beings and creatures come up from inside of the earth itself. And that's uh, referenced as the all-seeing eye as well. Now, the mom and the dad get together. They're having a little chat. And the dad is reading a book on the bed. I like to see what books that they're reading. It's kind of difficult to see right there. Uh, but if we zoom into it, we might be able to check it out. It says The Tommyknockers, which I believe is another Stephen King book uh, and movie too. So the Tommy Knockers. Check this out. Here's a quote from the Tommy Knockers. They're giving us more. Uh, they're giving us more substance to the esoteric story that the movie is really telling us. This is the story that so many people find it difficult to try to really put their finger on when they're trying to figure out what is this movie really talking about. Is it just about a kid with mental problems and he's struggling with schizophrenia? No. I don't think so. There's a deeper level to it. Now Stephen King's quote in Tommy Knockers says. Late last night and the night before, Tommy knockers, Tommy knockers knocking on my door. I want to go out. I don't know if I can because I'm so afraid of the Tommy knocker man. Now, these Tommy knockers, okay, we've talked about this a few times before. This is symbolically the spirit of the Lord or the angel of death that is released during the apocalypse that goes throughout the cities and the people are instructed and given advice to shut your doors, shut your windows, lock everything up and stay inside. Otherwise, these entities will try to get into your house. Right? They're looking to dock with your mind. They're looking to possess. I call it plasma possession. All right, so we go to uh, 
Donnie Darko's medicine cabinet. And as you can see, he's taking some kind of medicine there. So he grabs his pills. He's taking pills because he's he's got a different perspective. He sees the world differently than everybody else. So he's got a psychiatrist and stuff. And his parents are concerned about his, you know, the way that he sees things or whatnot. The clock hits midnight, 12 midnight, which symbolically when the clock hits midnight, that's the apocalypse, basically. October 2nd, 1988. Well, I thought the apocalypse was supposed to happen on Halloween in the movie, at least, right? It does. But it also happens uh, October 2nd, 1988. It happens twice in this movie. We'll come back to that towards the end. Uh, then there's a ghostly voice that says, wake up, wake up. I took a picture of that because like I talk about all the time, the movies are talking directly to us. They're telling us to wake up. At the beginning of the movie, they're saying, wake up. And they do this all the time. They say things like, open your eyes, wake up pay attention. And they say this as if they're talking to the other characters or something. They're not. They're talking to us. All right. So Donnie is in the middle of a deep sleep on this particular night when the world was supposed to end. And he gets up out of bed, which prevents the world from ending. Actually, he gets out of bed and he's sleepwalking. He starts walking around and the voice says, I've been watching you come closer. Now, you see him going towards this door in this sort of archway here. It's kind of difficult to make out, but if you see over on the side here, the windows on each side of the door is this image. I actually zoomed in on it there. It looks like a spider web, right? So on each side of the door are these spider webs, which is really interesting. It reminded me of um, the spider webs that you see. There's actually a gate underneath Sequoia National Park because there are these underground caverns and cave systems underneath Sequoia National Park and all around the world. And uh, their particular underground cave system is blocked off by this huge gate that looks exactly like a spider web underground. And actually, here's a picture of it right here. Um, here, let me zoom in on that so we can take a quick look at it. So this is that gate. Um, this leads to a cave called the Crystal Cave. And it's underneath Sequoia National Park, very close to where the Bohemian Glo Grove is, where uh, where the elite of the world are said to meet up on occasion from time to time. They also show the chandelier. Anytime you see the chandelier in the movies, symbolically, often it symbolizes our sky. Our sky is the ultimate chandelier. Or sometimes it's represented by um, uh, a disco ball, right? But the chandelier represents the sky and the glittering stars on the sky. Now the chandelier starts to shake and it starts to swirl, uh, move about. Donnie's out in the middle of nowhere and he comes across a giant rabbit. Let me zoom in on this giant rabbit because he's going to play a huge part in this movie. So it's some guy in a huge bunny suit or a bunny outfit. And the rabbit starts talking to him and he says, 28 days, 6 hours, 42 minutes. 12 seconds. That is when the world will end. So Donnie goes out and immediately he's told when the world's going to end, which I feel like a lot of people might be a little jealous of Donnie Darko because that's the first question that everybody asks me is when's it going to happen? When's the world going to end, right? Well, we're going to learn some clues as to see, uh, as to when that's going to happen. Now his sister comes home and the chandelier starts shaking back and forth. This something crashes down into their house, which causes the chandelier to shake. Symbolically, this is the heavens shaking. Symbolically, these are the stars being shaken out of their place. And it actually says this in the Bible. It says, I will shake not only, this is God speaking in the Bible. And he says, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Now, let me ask you a question. If the heavens are not physical, how can they shake? <laughs> right? If the heavens are physical, if the sky has some sort of a physical limitation or a boundary to it, then it can definitely shake right along with the earth. Now we go over to the next day and we see somebody, somebody's looking up and there's this guy and he says, son. Now look at that. The sun is right next to him. And he says, son, that's a question to you. That's a question asking you, is that the sun? Right? Then he looks at Donnie Darko and he says, son, ah, now we've got conflict. Here's a son and here's a son. Donnie Darko is also a son. Symbolically, he's going to, um, in a way, represent the blue beam of the world, that middle pillar, uh, that Jesus type of, of figure that we talked about before. 
It also represents various Christ-like figures, heroes of old, and uh, savior figures and whatnot. So he says, son, Donnie Darko, and he's sleeping on grass or something, exactly like we saw him at first when he was sleeping on the road. Now let's break down what Donnie Darko means. At first, I just thought it was Donnie, you know, Don or whatever, and Darko, like it means dark. So he's dark, it's sort of a dark movie, you know, that's not what it means. Donnie is short for Donald. Let's take a closer look at the root of Donald. Uh, the root of Donald means uh, world mighty or ruler of the world, and it comes from valos, which means ruler. It's the Proto-Indo-European root word, wall. So if you see W-A-L, as I'm sure you have in your daily lives, it means something that is strong or something that causes to be strong or something that is strong. And by implication and extension, it means a ruler, like a mighty one, essentially, which is what they used to be called as well. Donnie Darko is one of the mighty ones. Continues on and it says, the name Darko is primarily a male name of Slavic origin that means a gift. So gift of the mighty one is what Donnie Darko means. Donnie Darko, we're going to see in this movie, is himself a gift to the world. We're going we're gonna to come back to that one in a bit. Now, some other guy, you know, walks up to this guy and they're both looking down and you can see a flag in the background. Now we know they're on a golf course. He says, oh, it's Eddie, Eddie Darko's kid. So Donnie Darko is the son of Eddie Darko, right? I'm going to come back to these characters here in just a second. Now, Eddie Darko is Donnie Darko's father. What does Eddie mean? Why did they choose to give that character his name. And Eddie is a vortex or a whirlpool. So a some sort of a whirlpool or a spinning water or a vortex of water gives birth to Donnie Darko, which is the mighty gift to the world or the mighty one who is a gift to the world, right? Um, that Eddie or that spinning, spiraling vortex of water is said to be located at the original North Pole that used to be on uh, uh, maps everywhere, that waters that surrounded this mysterious island that has been since removed in the last couple of hundred years from all of our maps, it's no longer there. Everyone knew that that location existed. Everyone knew that there was an island divided by four rivers at the middle of the world and that that was the location of the Garden of Eden, that that was uh, Hyperborea, that that was some sort of a paradise in the middle of the world. And uh, those waters are said to be a current, a strong current that swirls around right up there at the North Pole. Now, I believe that that's true because today we have uh, this polar current up in the air that is responsible for much of our weather. And when that polar current stretches out and goes into flux, it brings down a lot of cold air. As above, so below. If the air is spinning around and we have a jet stream and a current up there, so will we down below in the waters below. Now, the other guy, I want to I want to point this out real quick. I want you to keep an eye on this dude, okay? We're going to keep an eye on this guy and come back to him for sure. But did you notice what he did? He blocked out the light. He caused an eclipse. He made it dark. He's going to represent a dark energy. Keep that in mind. We'll come back to that guy. Uh, so we talked about uh, Donnie Darko's father. His name is Eddie, which means a vortex. And then they say... Are you all right, son? Donnie looks down at his arm and here's what he sees. He has drawn some numbers, some random strange numbers on his arms. 2806-4212, which is the numbers that he was given by the giant uh, bunny rabbit when the world would end. 28 days, 6 hours, 42 minutes, and 12 seconds, right? Now, there's a lot of speculation, and I'll give you mine, about what that represents or what it may represent, right? The side reel month is the time needed for the moon to return to the same place against the background of the stars, which is 27 days, 7 hours, 43 minutes, and 12 seconds. Basically, if you go up one number or down one number on most of those right there, you get the number that's on Donnie Darko's arm. So we have an apocalyptic scenario that has something to do with the moon and its rotation around or over our world, right? So the moon and where it is and how long it takes to go in a circle is directly related, according to the movie, to when the apocalypse is going to happen. Keep that in mind. So Donnie Darko goes home. He starts walking home. There's cops at his house. And he looks up and sees a huge jet engine that they're pulling up out of his house. His sister goes, it fell in your room. 
A huge jet engine fell right into Donnie's Darko's room in the middle of the night. If he didn't go sleepwalking, he would have been crushed by this huge jet engine. And they, uh, the firefighters are up there. Now, keep in mind also, Donnie Darko's house is white, okay? Anytime that you see a white house, specifically in the movies, oftentimes it represents our entire world on a microcosmic scale, okay? It's a small version that symbolizes the rest of the entire world because it's easier to do that way. His sister, which is actually his sister in real life, Maggie Gyllenhaal, uh, says that they don't know where it came from. So check this out. This strange jet engine just fell out of the sky, crushed Johnny D Donnie Darko's room, and they have no idea, whoever they are, they have no idea where it came from. Uh, it's just a surprise. Then we see these guys working on it and stuff. There's a, a firefighter. There's some construction dudes. And then we've got some dude wearing like an all metal suit, which is really interesting too. Usually those, uh, those metallic looking suits are uh, heat resistant and they use those when something's super hot like if you're going to go near lava or something right which is kind of interesting because the other two are totally they're, they're just as close to it as he is right but they don't need to wear it so i thought that was kind of funny but if we zoom in or if we allow the movies to sort of play out it zooms in to this jet engine strange why would it do that right why would it keep zooming in all the way to the middle of this jet engine because of what you see here. What do you see here in the middle of this jet engine, right? It's a spiral directly in the middle of a jet engine. That's symbolic of the spiraling plasma that's going to come down during the apocalypse, right? Uh, it's also the number six or the number nine, depending on which cycle we are in, because one cycle, it will swirl one way. Another cycle, it'll reverse and it'll swirl back the other way. Now we go to Donnie Darko's school and uh, it's basically a religious, like Catholic type of a school. Everyone wears uniforms and stuff. Everyone in the, many people in this school are bad. Okay. This is not a school for like good kids, even though it's a religious school and everything. These kids are literally doing Coke in the hallway. And then check out the uh, sticker on this dude's locker. It says, what would Satan do? Hey, mother dragon. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, what would Satan do? So that's, that's what they're showing us. They're showing us that the school is full of bad energy. Okay. And the school also represents our entire world on a microscopic level, right? Let's jump into one of Donnie Darko's classrooms where Drew Barrymore <laughs> is teaching. I love Drew Barrymore. Uh, Drew Barrymore, she actually helped to produce this movie, which is pretty cool. She, well, she did produce this movie. So Drew Barry, and she actually put her own money and stuff into this movie so that it could get done and, and put into the box office and stuff, which is pretty cool backstory. So she's talking to the class and she's sort of the, the English lit teacher. And she says of how old misery's house had been destroyed. They're talking about a book, a short story where somebody's house had been destroyed. Exactly like Donnie Darko's house had been destroyed. The house is symbolic of the world, as we've talked about, right? The world is going to be destroyed. It's, it's symbolic of the apocalypse itself. Drew Barrymore walks over to the side and uh, she's asking, what is he trying to communicate with this passage? Now the passage, I don't know if I, let me, let me see if I brought it up here. Uh, we could pretty much see it right here. It says, one moment, the house stood there with such quiet dignity between the bomb site uh, like a man in a top hat, and then bang, crash. There wasn't anything left, not anything. And then Drew Barrymore is asking the class, but she's really asking you, uh, what is the author trying to communicate with this passage? This was so important that they put it into the movie. It could have quoted any book. You know what I mean? It could have been anything, but it's it's purposefully selected so that it gets us thinking. It gets our wheels turning. Donnie Darko says, well, it means that destruction is a form of chaos. They just want to see what happens when they tear the world apart. Lady Luke, hey, welcome. They just want to see what happens when they tear the world apart. So that's the theme that we're going to see, right? Not just in his world, but in our world too. We're looking at this like it's a mirror reflecting back to us the truths of, of uh, what is to happen in our world and what has happened before in the past, which is crucial. He says they want to change things. So in this story, um, I don't think I put it up there, but in this story, it's a short story. Uh, there is this, this guy whose house had survived um, 
the Blitzkrieg in, uh, I think it was Germany, if I remember right, which was all of these bombs that went off during one of the wars. Uh, Blitz means lightning, which is really weird because it's not like they used lightning to destroy the houses, but that's what they refer to it as. So uh, this guy's house survived the lightning attack, which was really a bomb attack, and he was left standing. But then these kids go in and they lock him into this outhouse. They go in to destroy his, his house and everything while he's in there. It's a really interesting book. Now, the new girl shows up in the back of the class and everyone's looking at her. She totally interrupts the class. And uh, she's like, hey, where do I sit? And Drew Barrymore's like, sit next to the boy that you think is the cutest, which I love. I love that Drew Barrymore breaks all of these rules that the school has. She walks this gray area because she's trying to stretch their minds and get them to think independently instead of just running them through the motions. Uncommon. Hey, thank you, man. I appreciate you. All right. Now, check it out. Do you see in the background right next to her? There's these interesting posters. I'm going to show you this one right next to her because I thought this was really interesting. It's done by an artist named Max Ernst right? Take a look at this. Do you see what we have here? We have what looks like the sun or something in the sky, except it's blue and there's two circles there and there's some sort of a person right there in the middle. That's an interesting piece of artwork. Let me show you some of the other pieces of artwork that the same uh, artist has done. Remember this circle, the double circle right there in the middle, right? Watch the artwork, right? There's the double circle. There's the double circle, all the same artist. There's the double circle. And this is actually like, uh, the title of that is like uh, a forest of some kind. There's the double circle. There's the double circle. This guy puts this in almost everything. He even put it into these characters in one of his, his other pieces. Here's another work. Here's another piece of work by Max Ernst. Check this out. It's a spiral, a red spiral at that, right? And it says here, um, that the name of this is, I'm going to try to pronounce it, Ofenlik Intladong Oder in der Northeast Jeder Hefenrecht, which, if we translate that, means public discharge or in an emergency, every port is right. Port is uh, an opening. Every, a, a port is an, a door, basically, or a window. A port is an, a, a means of exiting or entering something, right? So he says during an emergency, and he's referring to his piece of artwork, which is a spiral, right? During an emergency, when you see this spiral in the sky, basically, every, every port is the right port. <laughs> like, get out, basically. All right, so uh, she wants to go sit next to who she thinks the cutest, and they show you this guy's all getting ready, button up his or unbuttoning his top button of his shirt, trying to look slick. But did you see what's right next to him? Did you see? Dost thou not see? The movie puts these in here, letting you know what is important that they're trying to show you, right? Now we go to uh, Donnie Darko's dad picks him up. And he's driving home. He says, it's going to take about a week to fix the roof. The roof symbolically is our sky because that's what ushers in the apocalypse. The world depressurizes. All the pressure is building up right now, which has a lot of different um, uh, byproducts to it. Now, a lot of things are happening because there's so much pressure in the world today. And it's going to take about a week for our roof to be fixed, right? So the apocalypse itself is going to last about a week. And then he says, they still don't know. And his dad's like, no, what? Where it came from. Where it came from. The, the it, just like in uh, Stephen King's it, right? They call the entity from above, the plasma, that spirals down in. And it looks like spirits. It looks like snakes. It looks like uh, serpents. It looks like worms. It looks like dragons. It looks like all kinds of stuff. And because it looks like so many different things and it's open to so many people's interpretations and it's a shapeshifter, it's commonly referred to as it, and it is one of the scariest things that is out there in fiction. And so commonly, a lot of fic fiction writers, they just call it, it, right? All right, so his dad says, I had to sign a form saying that I wouldn't talk about, uh, saying I wouldn't talk to anyone about it. Isn't that interesting, right? It is code for the apocalypse, okay? It is code for the stuff that comes down from space. It came from outer space, right? Hey, thanks for the donations, everybody. I super appreciate it. All right, so he, he signed a form saying that he wouldn't talk about it. That's what happens whenever any, any one of us gets a clue. When we start getting a clue as to the cyclical nature of these reoccurring catastrophes that happen to our world, 
uh, usually people crack down on it. Um, oftentimes, and things start happening where they don't want people to talk about it, especially if people, um, they, what they try to do is they try to get you to, to, to agree. Okay. Oftentimes it's something that you would need to sign. You need to give consent that you're not going to talk about it. Okay. Which is commonly called the deal with the devil, right? Um, I have not made that deal with the devil so I can freely talk about it as much as I'd like to, which is nice. So he says, uh, so, so Donnie Darko, his dad just told him, I, I'm not supposed to talk to anyone. I signed a contract with the government basically. And Donnie's like, so we're not supposed to tell anyone what nobody knows. <laughs> his dad, I love his dad. His dad seems to have a cool uh, laid back demeanor and he starts laughing. He's like, yeah, totally. Uh, you're not supposed to tell anyone. We're not supposed to tell anyone what nobody knows because that's the thing. They don't want anybody to know. They don't. Why don't they want people to know that the world goes through a cyclical cataclysm? Because if you knew that, you would prepare for that. If you knew that, the entire world would run and act completely differently. We would stop depending upon other people and begin preparing and, and, and depending upon ourselves and we'd be self-reliant. So his dad says like, yeah, but uh, you, can, you can tell it to your, your therapist. And he says, her name's Dr. Thurman. So Donnie Darko, Darko's uh, safe place, you could say, which is his therapist, is her name is Dr. Thurman. What does Thurman mean? Well, it's interesting. It actually is from an old Norse personal name uh, that is a combination of Thor or Thor or Thor, right? And Mundur, which means protection or it can mean protection. So the protection of Thor or something that's under Thor's protection. Thor is akin to um, to Atlas, who holds up the world with both hands, the squatter man symbol that's squatting up there at the North Pole, which is just a plasma formation that shoots up out of the earth and touches the sky, right? That is the, the lightning god, the thunder god. Now we move on, and they actually almost hit this lady who's checking her mail, this really old lady who has a nickname. Her name is, her nickname is Grandma Death, which is... I like it. I think it's a cool nickname. Um, and she's checking the mail. So Donnie Darko stops because they almost hit her with the car and he's trying to help her out, right? So he walks up to her. She's looking into the mail. She seems kind of senile and stuff. Nothing in there. It's totally empty. There's a lot of symbolism that's happening in this, in this particular scene. First, I want to show you her name. As you can see on the mailbox, it says R. Sparrow. Her name is Roberta, Roberta Sparrow right? Like Jack Sparrow from Pirates of the Caribbean, same thing. So let's break that down. Let's see what that means and then come back to this to see what's going on here with Roberta Sparrow, Donnie Darko, and this mailbox, right? I see a lot of mailbox symbolism in the movies lately. So Roberta comes from Robert. It's a female version of the male name Robert. Robert comes from Hrold, which means fame or glory, something that is famous or glorious. And Bert, Bert, like Bert and Ernie, right? Bert. Bert means bright. It's from the Proto-Indo-European root word bereg, which is very similar to berg, like a city or a place that has bright, shiny lights, right? And that means to shine brightly, especially with white color, like a white light, right? So, Rodberg means, or Robert, or Roberta, means famous light or glorious light bright light, essentially, right? So she represents something that has to do with that blue beam, just like Donnie Darko. They're very similar characters. They're related to one another. Uh, Sparrow, let's check that out real quick. Sparrow comes from the root word spar. You see that? Now over here, it says it's from the Proto-Indo-European root word sper, which means spear, or a pole, which is so interesting because Donnie Darko literally uses the word spear a little bit later on in the movie. So what does Roberta Sparrow mean altogether? It's a sentence. It's a, it's a message being given to us. Her name, Roberta, means famous light or famous beam of light, basically. Um, and then a sparrow means a pole or a beam, a spear, a spear a brilliant spear of bright light, a famous spear of light, a famous beam of light, exactly like we showed you in the middle, right? That's the like the cross beam of Jesus, etc., right? Now, let's go back and re-examine that image. 
Let's check it out again. So symbolically, we have a woman who is related and has something to do with um, a bright, white, famous light. She goes to the mailbox to check it, but the mailbox is called the post. The box is on a pole. The box is on a post. The post is called such because it represents that same beam. Right now, we've got three beams symbolically. Roberto Sparrow, uh, Donnie Darko, and then the mailbox itself symbolically. Three beams, three lines. We're going to see that come up a lot, so keep that in mind. On top of the beam, which is the pole of the mailbox, is the box. The box is just a container. The box represents Pandora's box or Pandora's container, and it represents our world. She's checking in on the status of our world. The box has been opened, just like Pandora opened her box and let out all of the evil that we have to deal with in this world today. There's good news, though. That evil will one day be eradicated. We'll talk about that soon, too. So she's checking in on the world itself, and it's there's nothing there. There's no, there's no news. There's nothing going on. It's just empty, right? It, the world has opened up and it is being, and it has been emptied out, which is the apocalypse. It's the depressurization event. All right. So Roberta Sparrow, AKA grandma death. She walks up to Donnie and gives him a little old lady hug. And she whispers something into his ear. Uh, I believe she says every living, every living being on earth dies alone or something like that. So we go back to Donnie's therapist office, right? Mrs. Thurman or uh, protection of Thor, right? Oh, it's also Mond, Thor Mond. Mond also means world or by extension, a mound of earth, right? So Thor's mound, Thor's hill, Thor's mountain by extension once more, um, which is Mount Maru which is the plasma volcano or Rupas Nigra, the black mountain, the magnetic mountain at the middle of the world. We go back into the therapist's office and Donnie says, I made a new friend, Frank. <laughs> like you think he's going to say Roberta Sparrow, but he doesn't. He says, uh, yeah, Frank. He said to follow him. Now, I don't think I, I don't think I, oh, I did look it up. All right. So let's see what Frank means. I think we've looked this one up a couple of times in the past. Frank means free aka not a servant, a free man, a free woman, a free person, somebody who is free truly in the world to do whatever they like, somebody who has no laws against them, no rules, no uh, guidelines or anything, somebody who is truly free to do whatever they want to do. And that is representative of Frank, which is the giant bunny rabbit. Now, let's take a closer look. And it says here, Following the white rabbit. Okay, let's go back just a smidge. Let's just go back a second. So Frank said to follow him. Nigel, hey, good to see you. Frank says to follow him. He sees a giant rabbit. He, the rabbit says to follow him. We've seen that a few times before, right? Specifically Alice in Wonderland symbolism or the Matrix, you know, Neo with that tattoo of the, the rabbit on that chick's shoulder. Uh, Frank means free man. Let's look up the follow the white rabbit or the following the rabbit symbolism. Okay. Now, if we look it up in Google, it says following the white rabbit means following an unlikely clue and finding yourself in the middle of an extraordinary situation. This situation often challenges your beliefs and changes your life. That is nice, but that's all symbolic and wishy-washy. That's totally true. I agree with it. There's actually a physical, real, tangible extension to that. It means something physical in the world to follow the white rabbit. Now, if we take, if we go back to the root, which is uh, Alice in Wonderland, we've got the white rabbit. It is singing a song about being late because the apocalypse always comes late. Okay. It always, every time the apocalypse comes around, it's a little later than the last time, which throws off our timing in this world. People have to readjust their, their method of timekeeping because something happens to the world. I believe it grows. I believe it actually gets bigger each time the apocalypse happens. If that's true, it stands to reason that the, the, the length of time in the day um, is going to change as well which is going to change our clocks and our timekeeping and our seasons and all kinds of stuff, right? Now, if we follow this white rabbit, where does he go? Boom, he jumps right into this little rabbit hole. But where is the rabbit hole? We're supposed to follow this rabbit into this rabbit hole. People always focus on the hole, but they don't look at what's right above the hole. 
If you take a look at the movie version, it shows you a better image of what's right above the hole. Over here, it kind of looks like maybe a bush, but it's actually a tree. In the movie version, Alice comes over and uh, she, she sees that there is a hole right here at the base of this dead tree, basically in the movie. And that is where the hole, the rabbit hole is. It's always underneath a tree. Sometimes it's a bush or something, you know, some sort of a, a plant. Um, a hedge, I believe, was the first one. A hedge is really interesting because a hedge also implies a barrier, right? A marker saying like, hey, this is this is a barrier. This is a boundary. This is a fence. If you cross over it, you're in a different place. You're in a different property, different realm, different world, right? So that is following the right the white rabbit. We are to follow the white rabbit to a tree that has uh, some sort of a hole that leads to another world underneath it. If we take a look here, this is really interesting. It shows Alice going down the rabbit hole. Let's read what it says right here though. So she followed him into a rabbit hole beneath a big tree. That would be Yggdrasil. That would be the world tree. That would be that middle pillar, that middle beam of light that shoots up as a beam of plasma and then starts flooding out and branching out, creating all sorts of shapes in the sky. But what else does it say? Check this out. And down she fell, down to the center of the world, it seemed. <laughs> Did it seem like that? Or was it actually the center of the world, right? Uh, that's kind of what seems to be implied, uh, if you ask me. So the therapist is like, follow him? Where? Where are you going to follow the rabbit to? Well, we've just talked about it. It is, it is the, the tree in the middle of the world. Donnie says, into the future. So check this out. By extension, if we were to follow the white rabbit into, and we, we found out where the world tree was, and we, if we find where the world tree is, which is at the North Pole, um, I, I think so far, right? I mean, everyone's free to their opinions and stuff, right? Um, but this is just all according to my research thus far. If we went to the world tree, at the bottom where the trunk of the tree is, there should be an inner earth entrance or a huge cavernous system. And if we go there, then it acts as a type of time travel into the future, he says. And then she says, and what? And then what happens? What happens after you follow the white rabbit and you go into the world tree or whatever? He says, then he said that the world was coming to an end. <sighs> Isn't that interesting? Why do we need to follow the white rabbit? Why do we need to find the world tree? Why do we need to go to Mount Maru and then go down into the inner recesses of the world? Because the world's going to end. And that is a safe haven. That is a safe place. Once again, I'll refer back to Norse mythology. Uh, Leif and Leif Thrasir are basically um, the futuristic version of Adam and Eve who survive Ragnarok and Fimbleventer as well. So check this out. It says here, Two humans who are foretold to survive the events of Ragnarok by hiding in a wood, a wood is another name for a tree, called Hodmimi's Holt. Hodmimi is the name of this god. Uh, Holt is like a safe haven. It's a place where they, um, they collect and store things, basically, to keep them safe. Hodmimi's Holt. And after the flames have abated, which means they've gone away, they repopulate the newly risen and fertile world. So, Leif and Leif Thrasir in Norse mythology, symbolically, they follow the white rabbit, they find the world tree, and they stay there as a place of refuge, and they wait out the end of the world, while, while all the rest of the people are going through the apocalypse itself. All that craziness that I've talked about on my channel, they're safe from all of it. So people always ask me, where is the safest place to be or whatever? Um, my answer is going to be the only, the only number one on my list is going to be the North Pole at the world tree, at the base of the world tree, underneath it, inside of the world, because that's the eye of the storm that comes from the eye in the sky. We go on to read in, uh, if we go into the poetic Edda, uh, it says that Odin was talking to one of the giants and he asks him a question about who's going to survive Fimbleventer, which is the great winter that we've also talked about. I've done a video about Fimbleventer as well in my Plasma Apocalypse playlist. It's a great winter, three years long without any interruptions in between. And there's wars and stuff that break out during that time. So Odin wants to know. He asks this giant who seems to know. And the giant says it will be Leif and Leif Thrasir. Leif is, literally means life. Just, just in case you were curious, leaf means life. Leaf thrasir means the lover of life. 
So Life and Life's lover go to the world tree, Yggdrasil, and they hide. It says, Leif and Lithrasir, uh, the two will have hidden in the wood of Hodmimi's Holt. They will consume the morning dew as food. Now, Referring back to my last video where we where we talked about the blob, we talked about Slimer, we talked about the goo, we talked about uh, the ooze that is a byproduct of a strong electrical current, right? And these ghosts tend to leave it wherever they go. And they eat that. It's also directly related to Mountain Dew or the dew that comes from Rupus Negra, which is the trunk of the world tree, right? Uh, it erupts. It is the fountain of youth. It, it electrically charges the sky and causes uh, electrified, energized water droplets that's very viscous and slimy to form. And they drop down and splash down onto the ground. And if they're left there for a while, they actually harden and they become sort of wafer-like and crispy. All right, so we go to the school. We go back to the school, and they're all sitting there watching a, um, some sort of a presentation by this guy. He's the guy who eclipsed the sun with his head earlier. Remember that? He says, hello, my name is Jim Cunningham, and welcome to Controlling Fear. Now, check this out. Isn't that, inter isn't that ironic? He's doing a video presentation about how to control fear, but he actually represents dark energy. Let's see what his name uh, implies. Now, Jim is actually a letter. Jim is a letter. Jim. Jim is a letter in Arabic. It's equal to and the same as the letter Gimel or our letter C in modern modern day, right? But basically, it's a it's a G or a C. In the old alphabet, they didn't have a C, they had a G, okay? So it went A, B, G in the old alphabets. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, or in Arabic, Jim, right? So the G, the G at the middle of the world, the G symbolized the foot, and the foot meant a destination. The foot meant a place to go to, a marker, uh, a destination for you to walk to, basically. Um, so that's his first name. Cunningham, let's check this out. Now, immediately you're going to see this is this is uh, some of the symbols for the family line of the last name Cunningham. So if your last name is Cunningham, like Randall Cunningham, if you're an Eagles fan, I don't know. <laughs> um, this is your family crest, essentially. It's representative. It's represented by this unicorn in this particular image. I'm going to come back to the uh, these words right here. But it says that the name is from an area of Ayrshire which in turn got its name from, uh, let me make that a little bigger, Queeneg, Queeneg, and Queeneg means milk pail, along with the Saxon uh, suffix ham. So it means a village. So cunning ham literally translates to city of milk. Okay. Just like in the Garden of Eden, it says it is a land flowing with milk, just like you see here, and honey, which is the slime that we were referring to earlier that people eat and they live off of it because it's energized, right? People don't need to eat animals or meat or even vegetables or any of that stuff because not a lot of stuff's going to be growing immediately anyway. So the earth provides sustenance itself, right? And that's what his name harkens to. Why was his, why would his name harken back to something that sounds like it's good? This place, the safe haven and stuff, right? Because there is a war over that mountain. There is a war, there is a fight uh, to control that particular piece of land. That is the most coveted piece of land in all of our world, in my opinion, it seems, according to my research. Now let's take a closer look at the Cunningham Crest, okay? On each side, you're going to see that there's a, a rabbit, okay? These are weird looking rabbits because they're old or whatever. I don't know. But these are rabbits, okay? So we have a rabbit here and a rabbit here. These are the two witnesses. Anytime you see a crest with exactly one thing and exactly another thing in, in, on each side and they seem to be like holding on to something in the middle, that's because they act as two witnesses. These are the two, symbolically, the two other beams or the two other uh, criminals that were on those other crosses that I showed you at the beginning, right? There's the unicorn right there in the middle. Remember, uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, they sing uh, Firstborn Unicorn, right? Which is really interesting because of the next line. Now, look at the symbol. Check out this symbol. There's a Y. <laughs> why? Why is there a Y? It's Cunningham. There's not even a Y in Cunningham because that is not a Y. Things are not what they seem in this world, are they? Things have changed and you live in an upside down world where nothing is what it used to be. But I'm telling you what, the old ways are returning. 
Let me explain to you what this why is, and then I'm going to talk about this motto that they have. Check this out. Over, fork, over. Over, fork, over. Well, that's interesting. Remember, this guy, Jim Cunningham, he represents evil entities. He represents a bad energy, and it says over, fork, over. To like fork something over, right? Let's move in a little bit, a little bit deeper and learn some more. Now, this over fork over motto comes from a story about there was this prince and people were trying to kill him because they wanted to take over um, his lineage. They wanted to take over his kingdom and stuff. So they were trying to kill this child who was going to take over the throne. It says that he told Malcolm over fork over, uh, meaning put more hay over me or fork more hay over me because this kid hid in a little pile of hay. Uh, so I can hide from these devils. The deed is said to be the origin of the Cunningham motto over fork over. So what it means, this 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 uh, phrase over fork over literally is saying to hide these people, that they are to be hidden, right? Just like Jim Cunningham is is hidden in plain sight. He is an evil entity that is hiding and masquerading as some good guy, right? Let's continue on. We're learning a lot right now. Let's go back to this why. Why is that's that's right in the middle. That's got to be the most important part of this entire crest. It's directly front and center, right? So let's check out this why. Now in the ancient languages, specifically in like ancient Aramaic and Phoenician and stuff, if you go really far back, there was a letter, the sixth letter typically of the alphabet or the alphabet. It was named Vav. It is the Vav. It used to be drawn as a Y. Here's the modern Hebrew version of the Vav right there. And it essentially equates to our letter V today. And it means the number six as well, right? So when you see three sixes, it's three Vavs. What is a Vav? Well, in the old days, they drew it as a Y because this is what their tent pegs used to look like. When they would nail their, their pegs down into the ground to secure their tents, because they slept in tents, right? Uh, they would take rope and stuff and they would tie it around that Y portion so that it would be secure in the ground. And that's what that symbolizes, a tent peg. It also symbolizes a hook. So if you see any hook symbolism like Peter Pan's hook or Maui's hook, etc., all of that harkens back to this Y shape, which was a tent peg or a nail, you could say a nail, um, and it's ultimately something that is fastened into the earth, but comes up out of the earth, something that springs forth out of the earth, literally representing the spring of the fountain of youth. Also, that's the place where you can time travel. According to Donnie Darko, he says, if you follow the white rabbit, you're going to time travel and go into the future, right? Back to the Future has the Vav. It's an old archaic version of the Vav or the Y, right? It's not a Y. Keep that in mind. It is the it is the letter. Well, it represents a few letters. It represents V, U, double U or double V, and sometimes the letter F as well. It just depends on dialect. But basically, this is the nail of the earth, okay? And that and in, in Back to the Future, it's literally made out of light, right? Which is the sky beam that shoots up and then splits out towards the top because of the electromagnetics and how they work um, towards the top of the world. Now, Donnie Darko passes out on the couch. He goes to sleep. And then he starts having this dream. This is uh, a lot of water. looks like the ocean or something. There's the sky. These things structures on the left and the right here. This is his school. So what he's being shown is that his school is flooded. He's having, this is how, this is how dreams work sometimes. Okay. Sometimes dreams will speak directly to us through the right brain. The right side of the brain works in images and creativity and art and drawings and, and pictures and stuff like that, which is why I like to use so much of that because I like, I'm more of a right brain kind of person. I also like to balance that out analytically with the left side so that we can be balanced and central, right? So what is he being shown? A prophecy that the world, which is his school symbolically, is going to be flooded, right? That's one type of an apocalypse. Once by water, once by fire. Well, we've seen the water one. We got oceans, don't we? Right? That's not right. Like, where did all that water come from? That's from the flood. Now, we go back, we see the giant bunny rabbit, and uh, he starts talking to Donnie in his sleep. Donnie wakes up and starts sleepwalking and grabs an axe. The axe also symbolically is the hook. Okay, the axe symbolically is that same nail, that same vav, 
uh, etc. And he's going to use that to usher in a flood. Now, we go to the, the other school children. They're standing in line waiting for the bus to go to Donnie Darko's school. And his sister wrote this poem called The Last Unicorn, which I'm going to read as much as I can here real quick, by Samantha Darko. There once was a unicorn named Ariel. Ariel was the most beautiful unicorn in the world. Right? Unicorn means unicorn. Corn means horn, right? Or protrusion, right? So one protrusion, one horn, and it's the most beautiful one in the entire world. Ariel was discovered by a prince named a prince named Justin. Uh, the prince was led into, and I can't read the rest of it, but she says it. The prince was led into a world of strange and beautiful magic by this most beautiful unicorn protrusion in the world, right? Interesting. So it, there's so many levels of symbolism here. She's reading something that's symbolic to her friends, and then we're looking at it symbolically. There's a lot of meta happening. It's going to get even more meta when they go to the movie theater. All right, so they're all waiting for the bus or the box or the container to come pick them up, right? And uh, these girls come up and they say, hey, my mom told me that the school is closed today because it's been flooded. Donnie Darko's dream came true. He actually had a part in that, as we'll see in a bit. You can see the water's all rushing into uh, the school people's feet and stuff. And then they see this statue where that hook, that vav, was planted into this statue. That's their school mascot, which looks like some kind of a dog. Um, which we'll talk about too in a minute. And uh, they even made a comment. I didn't, I didn't capture it right here, but they said, isn't that solid bronze, <laughs> right? This is your sword and the stone symbolism, okay? That's the vav, that's the hook that comes out of uh, the magnetic mountain, right? That nobody can remove except for the chosen one, except for the, somebody who is pure of heart. When the king returns, it's King Arthur symbolism as well. Now, take a look at this school mascot, right? This is how you can tell that it's, it's a very strong symbol, uh, that it doesn't mean this is just not a regular school. This is extremely symbolic. It's this, it's this humanoid that has a dog's face, right? Really interesting. And then he's got this club with spikes all over it. This dog is some kind of a warrior. He's some sort of a killer, basically. This is the school's mascot, right? Really weird. We're going to come back to the school mascot in a bit. And then it says, they made me do it um, around the middle there. And they is us, basically. Okay, the world made me do it. That's what, that's what that means. They is us, okay? All of us. Now, he's walking home with the new girl. He's got a crush on her. She likes him too. They sat next to each other. And Donnie's like, oh, I was in jail once. I mean, I, I burned this house down. Whoa, check that out. Donnie Darko, not only did he just flood a school, but he burned down a house in his past and he had to go to jail for it. So symbolically, that is a past fire apocalypse, which means if it happened in the past, there's nothing new under the sun. It's destined to repeat itself, right? So we should see another fire apocalypse symbolism later on. And then she says, Donnie Darko, what kind of name is that? It's like some kind of superhero or something. And then just right on cue, so smooth. He just looks right at her. What makes you think I'm not? Right? What makes you think he's not? Because he literally is the superhero of the world, symbolically speaking. He represents the light of the world, that, uh, that savior type figure of the world, right? They go on with their conversation. It seems to be mean meaningless, but it's not. She says, for physics, uh, Montanoff is having me write this essay, the greatest invention ever to benefit mankind, right? And he goes, oh, uh, well, it's, Mon it's Monotoff, and uh, that's easy. It's, it's antiseptics, antiseptic. So the greatest invention, she asks, he, she, he basically is saying, I think that the greatest invention ever is antiseptics. Well, isn't that just about right? If he represents the blue beam, right, that, that emerges from the world and cleanses the world and everything changes and, and becomes cleansed out, because that's what happens during the apocalypse. That's why we have the apocalypse, okay? If we didn't have the apocalypse, everything would just get worse and worse and worse and worse until it destroyed itself due to entropy. Entropy needs to stop at some point. And then we have to have the opposite of entropy, which is regeneration um, and growth and life and stuff, right? All right, so let's look up septic for antiseptic. What's an antiseptic? Septic means to make rotten or putrid or cause something to rot, 
right? So antiseptic means to uh, to be against putridness, to be against rottenness, to begin to be against things that are disgusting and bad, right? He's they're talking about the the condition of the world that we live in today, right? So he says antiseptics. Now check this out. If we do a, a quick deep dive into antiseptics, you'll come across this. An atmospheric pressure plasma jet is used for sterilization of antibiotic resistant bacteria. The plasma is non-thermal. That means it's 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 hot and it's hot, but it's it's not so hot that it will burn you. You can touch non-thermal plasma. Sometimes it's referred to as cold plasma. Jedi, hey thanks, man. I super appreciate it. All right. So, basically what am I saying? It says it can be applied this plasma can be applied to living tissue without thermal damage, without getting burned. That means that you can stand in the fire and not be burned. I'm sure some of you have heard that story a time or two in the past, right? Standing in the fire and not being burned. Now we go back to the therapist's office and Donnie's letting her know, hey, I met somebody. I met a girl this time, a real actual person. <laughs> I met a real person, right? And her name is Gretchen. That's an odd name. That's a, that's. I mean, that's an unusual. It's a different name. I like it. It's a cool name. Let's find out what Gretchen means. So this is. Uh, we're going to learn more about some uh, Donnie Darko's mate or something that is associated with that blue beam, right? So if we look up Gretchen, it says a female proper name, German diminutive of Greta, like Hansel and Gretel, basically, right? Greta, a German and Swedish pet form of. Margaret or Margareta, right? So Gretchen is the same as Margaret. What does Margaret mean, I wonder? Let's check that out. If we look up Margaret, as we saw when we broke down the movie Sea Beast, right? Uh, Margarites or Margarita means pearl. A pearl which is of unknown origin. They don't even know what, where the word pearl comes from, but I have a sneaking suspicion. I have an idea and a theory. Let's talk about the theory. It goes on if we look up the root pearl, if we look up the word pearl and we look up its root, we started with Gretchen, we moved on to Marguerite or Margarita, and then we, we learned that Marguerite and Margarita means pearl. Let's look up pearl, right? Other theories, because they don't know what it means, basically, other theories connect it to the root of the word pear, like the fruit, right? Well, that's interesting. So margarita is directly related, and Gretchen, by extension, is directly related to the word pear. The word pearl is related to, many people uh, believe this, that it's related to pear. Hey, Brent, good to see you. So let's look up pear. Let's go deeper. I'm, I'm ready. Let's do Let's go deep. Now, the word pear likely shares an origin with the Greek apion, which means pear, or apios, which means pear tree. Can you see? Can you hear how apion and apios could also possibly be a potential root word for apple as well, right? So there's these pears or these apples, right? Now, if we check this out, the pear... Homer, the great writer, described pears as a gift from the gods, right? Why would pears be a gift from the gods? There's all kinds of fruit and stuff. People would say, oh yeah, pears are super healthy and stuff. You should eat pears because they're, the gods used to eat them and stuff. No, 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 no. The gods ate pears, okay? They didn't eat actual pears like this one right here, okay? Just like they ate apples, just like they ate sacred honey from the sacred bees and stuff. It's cartoonified imagery, right? There's some sort of a fruit that grows off of this tree of life. And it, uh, the people called it different names. Sometimes it was golden apples. Sometimes it was pears. Sometimes it was uh, peaches and stuff, right? As we've talked about before. Now we go to Donnie Darko. We're following him out into this field. This is just a chill place where him and his friends hang out. And uh, his friends are having this talk about Smurfs. Just seems to be a casual conversation. I'm listening because I did a whole video about how Smurfs are based off of a real true story, okay? Real life, actual hidden history of our entire world. And it's hard to see here, but the, the guys are saying, we got to find ourselves a, a Smurfette, like this cute little blonde that'll get down with the guys. Let me time out, okay? They're being base, okay? I'm not saying that sex or anything that is grown up in nature is base. I'm just saying... The movie is showing us that 
these these uh, sacred types of rituals, like the ones that we're talking about, have been demeaned. They've been belittled. They've been made base by the world that we live in today, which is filled with negative energy because Pandora's box has been opened. So they're talking about how they need to get themselves a little Smurfette because they're assuming Smurfette hooks up with all the other Smurf dudes because the Smurfs are mostly guys, basically, right? However, there's an entire Smurf girl village, if you've if you've seen it. I've, I've, I've got a little kid, so I know all about the cartoons and stuff. Anyways, so they're like, yeah, we got to get us a, a Smurfette, basically. So Donnie's like, he's 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 disgusted by his own friend's talk. They're being vulgar, man, and he's that's not his deal. I mean, well, that's, that kind of is his deal sometimes, right? Especially when he's under hypnosis. But he says, first of all, Papa Smurf didn't create Smurfette because his friends are like, yeah, that's why they cre- Papa Smurf created Smurfette so she can make little Smurf babies with everybody, basically. He's like, no, 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 you're wrong, man. Papa Smurf did not create Smurfette. Gargamel did, okay? And if you want more information about that, go check out my uh, my, my video in my Ancient Oblivion series about the Smurfs, uh, Smurfs based on a true story. He goes on to say, she was sent in as Gargamel's evil spy with the intention of destroying the Smurf village. But the overwhelming goodness of the Smurf way of life transformed her. Do you see what he's doing as the blue beam? This is magical, okay? Forget all his drama, forget all his problems that he has as an individual human or whatever, but symbolically, this is what this is what um this is what uh the alchemist does. Okay, and he represents the alchemist. The alchemist changes something that is base into something that is pure. Okay, usually it's seen symbolically as base metals into gold. But what he's doing is he's taking something that is base, which is his friend's talk, and therefore their frequency, and therefore the vibration that surrounds him, and he's changing it. He's saying, no, 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 guys, listen, Smurfette was there to like make everything all evil and bad kind of how you guys are talking about, but she was so overcome with the goodness of all the Smurfs that she was changed by it, which is exactly what Donnie Darko is doing by calling them out and saying, hey, how about this? There might be another way to look at things. Instead of looking at things through those uh, through those glasses and perspective of, of vile baseness, you could look at it from a positive perspective. Paolo, thank you. I appreciate you. Now, they take a look down the road and they see Grandma Death, a.k.a. Roberta Sparrow, which we've talked about. She's just standing in the road. She almost gets hit by a car again. She was almost hit by Donnie Darko and his, and his dad, right, Eddie. And then she's almost hit by this lady right here. And she helps her to go back to the mailbox. She, she keeps on going back to that mailbox. She keeps going back to the post over and over and over. She's a watcher. She's checking for the post. She's That's what the watchers were, okay? Some people believe that the watchers were like there to watch over humanity, but some people, like myself, believe that there are watchers who are watching for the day to come when the light shines once more, where that eternal flame shoots back up into the world, right? And they had watch towers that were specifically for that reason so that they could see very far and they could see when the, when the light of the world shot back up. So she checks it again, no mail. She keeps going back and forth, back and forth. She is stuck in a loop, which is also a time loop that the movie references over and over and over. We are stuck in our own little loops. There's there's loops upon loops. There's spirals upon spirals all over the place. Many of us can get stuck in that current, right? You can get stuck in that vortex. You can get stuck in that loop and that spiral over and over. Paolo, oh, thanks again. I super appreciate it. All right, so Grandma Death. We're going to come back to Grandma Death as well. Now, we go to Donnie Darko's bathroom where he hangs out with Frank quite often. He's looking into the mirror and he hears the voice of Frank. And Frank says, don't worry, you got away with it. He turns around and looks Frank in the eye. And he goes to touch him, but he stopped. And as you can see right there, it says there's an eerie humming. Not Donnie Darko's like humming, like, hmm, 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 right? It's electrical humming. That's why they put that in there because his hand stops right there. He can't go any further and there's this electrical sound, which is this humming. So he takes his hand off and Frank is right there. The giant bunny rabbit's just on the other side, but he can't touch. There is a barrier between the two. So he tries it again. He tries to, he tries to stick his hand out. He says, how can you do that? How, how, how can you do that, right? How is, this, how is this happening right now? 
And Frank puts his paws up there, boom. And you can see there's plasma right around his hand if you look closely, right? And uh, Donnie's like, whoa, what's going on right now? He's trying to figure this stuff out. He's, he's, he's being fed information in the form of imagery by this uh, symbolic element, which is Frank the bunny rabbit, right? So he tries it again. He keeps on trying to put his hand through there. Frank says, I can do anything I want. He's free, remember? Frank means free, the free man. And Frank says, I can do anything I want to. I'm free, I'm Frank. You know what I mean? He says, and so can you. Ooh, interesting. So can you, Donnie, right? So if Donnie represents the blue beam, if he represents the gift to the world, which is goodness and purity and stuff like that, right? Which sounds like it might conflict with what you see Donnie doing in the world, but it's not. It's, it depends on your perspective. If you're on the side of good, then you would see Donnie as being good because he's destroying all the evil in the world, basically, right? Um, even though they try to make him look like he's out of his mind and schizophrenic and stuff, right? Frank says, I can do anything I want. And so can you. So can you. So can you. We can do anything we want to, but I don't think people believe that. I, th I believe that most people have forgotten that. Most people have forgotten that you can actually do whatever you want to do. They used to call that the law of the land. Um, I believe in the law of the land. I support the law of the land. I support you in doing whatever you choose to do. And I, I support others doing whatever they choose to do. And I support people responding to however, whatever people are doing, however they want to respond to it. You know what I mean? True freedom in the world. He says, you can do whatever you want as well. Now, why is there a barrier between the two? There is an energetic field. Now, in fiction and sci-fi, this is called a force field. But as time moves on, we're starting to learn that force fields are not as fictitious as we once thought. Paolo, thank you. Gosh, man, I like the little sticker too. Thank you. Now, let's take a look at force fields. There is a force field that you carry around with you. Okay, there is an energetic field or flux around your body and inside of your body. You are an electrical entity, okay? And therefore, you have an electrical field that goes around you. Most of us have forgotten about it. Most of us have been uh, pulled down so low and have become uh, pretty basic. I'm just going to be honest. The, many people are basic these days, including myself. Like all of us are very basic compared to our potential. Okay. And that potential will be unlocked one day, but here is you, here is us. This is what is around us. It, people ha have different names for it, an auric field or whatnot. Now, if you have two people like Donnie Darko and Frank right next to each other, their auric field, depending on how, how much flux it has been pushed out, like how much flux it's in or, or how large it is, right? How strong that field is, how strong your energy is, how strong your life force is, it will be further out. It'll be a bigger force field, basically. And some people can control it. Some people can manipulate it. Actually, I think every, everybody probably could. Um, it's just that they, most people forgot how. They don't know how to do it, right? They don't, it's not like they teach this in class, right? In schools or anything, right? Um, that would be awesome, right? But they don't. Um, so when they get close to each other, those force fields interact with one another, right? So here's an example of the heart and the energy that comes out of the heart, creating sort of a, a toroidal field around the heart and thus around the body. It is an electromagnetic field. Let's take a closer look at this, just like in a magnet. It's magnetic, right? There's a north, there's a south, there's a positive, there's a negative, and it goes in, into a flow, into a design. And I'm going to read this to you. An electromagnetic field, also known as an EMF or an EM field, is a physical field. Physical. That's why Donnie Darko is stopped. His physical hand is stopped by this physical field produced by electrically charged objects. The field can be viewed as the combination of an electric field and a magnetic field. The electric field is produced by stationary charges and the magnetic field by moving charges or currents. The electromagnetic field extends indefinitely throughout space and describes the electromagnetic interaction. And here's another version of it, two fields interacting with one another. Our thoughts and emotions affect the heart's magnetic field, which energetically affects those in our environment, whether or not we are conscious of it. What does that mean? Simply put, that means whatever vibes you have going on on the inside affects your physical reality and the physical reality of others, depending upon what they're doing with their electrical fields, right? 
So I'll give you a really simple example of that. If somebody has ever walked into a room and they have real bad vibes, something super off or something, right? You can tell somebody just came in with bad energy or something, or maybe you're in a crowd full of evil people and somebody with really good energy came in. Usually it's the other way around for me. But um, you can tell something's off. Something you, you notice it, you feel it, you sense it because it's real, because it's physical, because it's actually working on various realms, spiritual, energetically, um, electrically, magnetically, et cetera, right? So our fields interact with one another. Now check this out. This is really interesting. It reminded me of the movie Old by M. Night uh, Shyamalan. Shyamalan Mena. M. Night Shyamalan, he did this really cool, I love all his movies, every single one of them, right? There's one that he did recently called Old, right? Which is this island where uh, these tourists are tricked into going to this secluded beach on this on this little area or whatever. I don't know. Anyways, these people go to this beach, right? They're not supposed to go there. The beach, once they get there, they're trapped there. They cannot leave this beach. And what happens is they start becoming old really quickly, right? It's a really interesting movie. I don't want to get too much into it. But the point is, they tr when they try to leave the beach, right? they actually encounter a force field, which causes them to black out. They cannot physically pass beyond this invisible barrier that is an electrical field or an electromagnetic field. This is from the script. I want to read this to you real quick, just in case you haven't seen the movie Old. Now, somebody tried to get off the island and the other characters say, you stumbled back out because they went through this crevice or whatever to try to get out. You stumbled back out. You were holding your head and it looked like you were in pain. You blacked out. And the guy says, I felt pressure in my head. Are you okay? I'm, I'm fine. I think it's the shock. Interesting choice of words, right? I think it's the shock. They try to get off this island and they get this pressure feeling in their head and they just black out and they, they reappear right back on the island, which is really interesting. That's an example of what's happening with Donnie Darko and Frank right now. There's an electrical field or... Um, what is it called? I told you, I spaced. I'm sorry. Um, a force field. Thank you. Or thank me because I just thought of it. Uh, this is also from the movie. It says magnetism of this exact spot on earth with the rocks on this beach submerged beneath the ocean for millions of years. Um, so they're talking about how this field might work and why this field is preventing them from leaving this beach. And they're talking about how it has something to do with magnetism because of the rocks of the earth that are, go down into the waters or the ocean waters, which equates to the anode and the cathode that are on either, either side of that uh, mysterious island. All right, we're getting pretty deep. Let's back off just a tad bit here and let's go to the Bible and let's see if there's a magnetic field reference or an electromagnetic field or a force field reference in the Bible. We find it in the book of Revelation where it talks about the apocalypse, right? And then it talks about how there will be this safe haven, this safe area um, for good people or people who have good vibrations or a positive energy to live and to stay there, right? And then everyone else can just basically try to, try to survive outside of the island. It doesn't mean that you're evil or anything. It just means that you're you're living with everybody else, right? Now it says here, in uh, verse 26, and into the city will be brought the glory and honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter into this sacred safe place, the city, nor anyone who practices an, um, an abomination or a lie, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So what this is saying is this is describing this, this um, city that's known as New Jerusalem. Okay. It's a safe haven in the post-apocalyptic world. And basically they're saying, if you have bad vibes, you can't get into this place. Okay. It's not like you need like, you know, uh, an ID card that says, Oh, Hey, I'm, I'm with you guys or whatever. No, no, no. Your ID card is your vibe. It's your frequency. It's your energy. They know if you belong, if you get in, if you get in, you're good to go. High five. Hey, welcome. If you don't, you try to pass through that. Your energy will be blocked, right? Positive and negative push against each other or I'm sorry, um, um, they're, they're, they're different energies. And I, I have a theory that if you match the energy of that frequency, you can pass through it. If you have a different energy, you're blocked from going through it and you'll probably black out or pass out or, you know, who knows, maybe die. I don't know. All right, let's move on back to the movie. Now we're in class and here's uh, one of Donnie Darko's teachers, super religious lady, church lady. 
And she's got this line and it says, fear and love. And this is what is taught by this Jim Cunningham character played by Patrick Swayze. So Donnie Darko gets up there and the lesson is he's supposed to read this card and then he's supposed to put an X on the board wherever the situation goes. Is it love or is it fear-based, right? So it says here, Ling Ling finds a wallet on the ground filled with money. She takes the wallet to the address on the driver's license, but she keeps the money that's inside the wallet. Ooh, so she's like, where are you going to put the X, fear or love? And she totally wants him to put it into the fear side. But Donnie Darko's like, you can't lump things into just two categories like that. Remember, he represents the middle path, balance, the middle beam between the anode and the cathode, between the good and the bad or the good and the evil, right? Donnie's like, dude, you can't just lump two things into that bipolar category. It's, it's either good or it's bad. You know, there's a whole spectrum to consider. She says, well, the lifeline is divided that way. Basically, uh, I don't care about what you just said. We're not here for philosophy. You're not here to teach me. I'm here to teach you the things that were told to me that I'm going to teach you. This is exactly how our academics institutions work, okay? Questioning is not usually allowed. There's a falsity and they pretend like questions are allowed. But really, if you're like me and you've asked a bunch of questions, you tend to get like peer pressure from the other students who go, oh man, oh my God, blah, blah, blah. Or the teacher will just straight up get frustrated with you and become angry, right? So Donnie's kind of like me. I could totally relate to him. He's like, you can't just lump it all together like that. Not only that, but what if Ling Ling, what if that was, uh, what if that was her husband's wallet? You know what I mean? It's really interesting because he literally finds somebody's wallet later on. I just thought of that. Uh, but what if that was her husband's wallet? So she just took the money and gave her husband back the wallet. Which is fine, right? I mean, could be. John Lombardo, thank you. Happy Halloween to you too. She says, if you don't complete the assignment, you'll get a zero for the day. That is a threat. That is saying, if you don't believe in what we believe in, or if you don't believe in what we are teaching you and indoctrinating you into believing, right? Because that's what that's what's happening here. They're indoctrinating people. They're conditioning people to live a particular way so that when they release you, you continue to live in that particular way, which is a slave class. She says, you'll get a zero for the day. You won't get any credit, right? You're not going to be successful and all your students will be upset and it's all this pressure and stuff. Now he's in the principal's office, basically, in the dean's office. And the dean is like, what exactly did you just say to Mrs. Farmer, your teacher? And the te his parents are there, his mom and dad. There's a school meeting and stuff because he did something bad, right? She's there. The teacher's there. She goes, he asked me to forcibly insert the lifeline exercise card into my anus. And the dad starts busting up laughing, but he starts, <clears throat> he starts pretending like he's coughing. And you can see the smirk on Donnie Darko's face, right? Um, and then they leave the office. The dad is cracking up. I love, look at the dad's face. I have to zoom in on this. Look at that. Look at him, man. He's cracking up, right? I love that. All right. So it shows us a quick glimpse of the outside of the school. We're about to take a tangent. I hope you're ready. Do you see this symbol? It's a cross or a plus sign, right? Which means positivity. And it says IHS. You may have seen this symbol somewhere before. This is this this is the symbol for their school. This representative of their religion of Catholicism, right? Or the school's religion. IHS. What does that mean? Most people, if you look this up, will say that it's it's like a nickname or a shorthand version of writing Jesus. Well, Jesus is only like two extra letters longer than this. So that that explanation does not make a lot of sense to me personally, that you're going to take something that's already short, right? And you're going to make it that much shorter. I'm not saying it's impossible. And I believe that it, that this type of a thing is specifically called out in the Bible when it references the Nicolaitans or this group of uh, people called the Nicolaitans, which I believe is where we get nicknames from, like Saint Nick. That's not his name. It's Nicholas or Nicolaus or the victory of the people, if you want to say it the right way. Um, and then we give it a Nick. We give it a shorter form, right? So it could be, but I'm not super convinced because first of all, that's Greek letters. It's iota, eta, uh, sigma, I believe, right? Eta is not the letter H. I mean, it's it's similar, but let's do a deep dive into this real quick, just so we can figure out what these three letters mean and how it's related to Donnie Darko. If you type in IHS um, and 
And you can also actually put in tombstones because it's often put onto Catholic people's tombstones. This is what you get. Let's take a closer look at this IHS. Right here, you can see that there are three beams, right? And there is an S. So what they're trying to say, all of these together, let me give you a quick backstory. The quick backstory of the whole IHS thing is that the ancient Christians used to put IHS on stuff as this esoteric symbol that meant that they were good people, basically, right? But I don't believe that they wrote IHS the way you saw it on Donnie Darko's school. I believe it looked like this because this is mysterious and this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to most people. IHS, you could start guessing as to what it might symbolize or represent, right? This is something else entirely because all three of those letters are stacked on top of one another. What we have here are three separate beams. The middle beam, as you can see, is much longer than the other two. And then we've got these, this S thing that wraps around it. Let's look at some other examples of this, right? Here's another one on a tombstone. This one is even more interesting because the S is starting to look more snake-like, right? That's because nobody draws an S like that that I know of. Uh, the H in the middle is non-existent. The H only comes from an optical illusion of this beam and this beam looking like they're connected by the middle portion, which is the S that comes through the middle part. So there really isn't an H there. It just looks like there is, right? Let's take another look at some more examples here. This one is really interesting because the middle beam has a cross section on the top of it. Boom, as you can see. And then off to either side are these two spheres or balls or circles. If you look two dimensionally, right? This is very interesting. As you can see, there's no letter H. It's just three beams and there's an S in the middle with two balls on either side. I'm going to get somewhere with this in just a second. Here's another example uh, of the three beams and the S right there in the middle. Here is another example. Some people are probably already in the chat saying that this looks a lot like the dollar sign, right? You're right on, by the way. We'll talk about that. All right, here's another example. Here is yet another example of these three beams with an S in the middle. It reminded me of this, which was this uh, the staff of Moses, you could call this. This is uh, one of the medical symbols, and it means healing right? It is a staff or a beam, usually with like a round thing at the top, which, because this beam, the staff of the world, which is the world tree is directly underneath that opening in the sky, which is a circle in the sky. That's why they usually have a little knob or a circle on the top of it. And then we have the snake that wraps around it, which is uh, plasma. It's how plasma moves about and, and undulates and swirls around those beams. So I took the liberty of making my own artistic rendition of this. And I'll share that with you. Actually, let me make that a little smaller. So here we would have three plasma volcanoes. Okay. And this is not to scale or anything like that. But if you imagine that there, that the beams of light or the earth energy shoots up and out of these inner earth entrances, AKA volcanoes and cave systems shoot straight up into the sky. And then you have like, um, this plasma is not going left to right. It's wrapping around it. Okay. So it's actually coiling around it. This is a beam of plasma collectively. And this is what it could possibly look like with the S right there in the middle. This symbolizes a place of value, a valuable place, uh, something, some place that has uh, worth like things that we consider worth like gold. Here is an example of an ancient gold coin from Justinius II, I think, right? A long time ago. This is like super old coin, okay? So this emperor or whoever he was, this world ruler, um, on one side, he put like the image of Jesus or something. You can see IHS right there, sort of off to the side. And then it says Christos Rex, which means Christ King or illuminated ruler or king. And then on this side, I want to see this side. What is this? This guy is holding on to something over here. Let's take a closer look at that. Boom. Now, this is supposed to be the ruler himself. If it's Justinian II, I don't know. But he's got this staff. And then the staff has these weird balls that are attached to it. Like it's got a, it's got a secondary cross section. So it has like a double cross. And then it's got two other uh, beams off to the sides, right? With these little ball points on it. At the base of this staff is an unfinished pyramid, aka a plasma volcano. 
or a volcano because it doesn't have the top, right? Because it's open at the top. So this is the world tree, symbolically. This is why the leaders of the world were always shown holding these staffs. I believe, so far, um, one of my theories is that oftentimes when you see these ancient depictions of gods, right, um, and they're holding onto a wand or a staff of power or something, maybe it's the inverse. Maybe that staff represents the god or the mighty one. And then the person is just the cartoonification that gives attributes to that beam of light. You see what I mean? So these little balls basically would be the pears the apples, the nectars of the gods, etc., right? The fruit that grows off of the tree of life. Here's another example of it. He's holding on to one of those little balls right there that has a little cross section on it, um, meaning this was the fruit of the gods that they wanted to eat, that this was the holy fruit, okay? Or the holy hand grenade of Antioch, right? Um, and then here's another one with the unfinished pyramid, Rupus Nigra, the plasma volcano, shooting up the world tree with these two witnesses on either side. Uh, let's check this out too. Here's another old uh, picture of this snake that's wrapped around these two bars here. And it says that some people have hypothesized that uh, the origin of the dollar sign, which I saw some people in the chat talk about, the dollar sign had its origin with the pillars of Hercules. Now I have also done a pillars of Hercules video in my plasma apocalypse playlist, where we break down what these pillars of Hercules were, which is these, the two witness beams, essentially. Okay. Those two other beams on either side of that central pillar. Here's an example of how the pillars of Hercules are portrayed. Can you see the symbolism, the dollar sign symbolism there? This is a place that has value, some place that has wealth and riches and stuff like that, right? In between these two pillars or these two columns, right? Which are on the ocean, as you can see there, because um, this is this is beyond the Arctic Circle, basically. So you have to go across the ocean to get here, basically. All right, back to Donnie Darko. So we're going to go to Donnie Darko's classroom, his science teacher, which is super cool. I like his science teacher and I like um, his English lit literature teacher, uh, Drew Barrymore. They're actually dating in the movie. Both of them are totally laid back and cool. I like them. But let's take a closer look. What's in the background over here right behind him? Now, it seems to be just a random scene, but we've got these three pillars, these posts, these columns or whatever these are, cylinders, with these three balls on the top. I wonder what these could be. I wonder what these could represent. Um, God, I can't, uh, Van de Graaff? I can't remember the name of them, but basically these things produce electricity, right? So these are only two, an image of two of them, and they create an electrical arc between the two. Imagine if you had a third one right there in the middle, right? Uh, here's, here's an example of what happens when you touch one and, uh, and, and, and you're touching it in a safe way so that you don't get shocked, basically. <clears throat> and your hair goes all crazy, just like this girl, which also looks a lot like Grandma Death, right? Check this out. Here's the girl touching the electricity or the, the, the pillar or the column that has electricity that comes off of it. Look at her hair. Look at Grandma Death touching Donnie Darko. Now, her hair was already like that, granted, right? But Grandma Death is directly related to Donnie Darko, symbolically speaking. We're going we're gonna to touch on that more in just a bit. 500 people watching. Wow, it's an honor. Thank you. Happy Halloween to everybody. Uh, so Donnie Darko is talking to his teacher about time travel. He's super interested. And he's like, hey, do you know anything about like you know time travel? And uh, his teacher says, theoretically, it's a wormhole in space. And then they show you a slinky, which is really interesting, right? Now, I'm going to show you, I, I took the liberty of making another drawing for an example, a wormhole, okay? First of all, in from J. Dreamer's perspective, from a, from a plasma apocalypse perspective, black holes are when the sky opens up. It's the place where the sky depressurizes. The world goes dark, so it's black. And then on the other side, you can see that it's lit up on the other side because out there in the heavens is light. Out there in space is light, okay? If you were to actually remove the sky, you could see a whole bunch of light. But... Uh, what wraps around our world is plasma. In academics, they even agree with this and they teach that we have what is called the plasma sphere that basically incubates our world. That plasma cannot come down into our world or we have we would live we would have an apocalyptic scenario every single day if we didn't have the electromagnetic barrier keeping that plasma out. 
But when that electromagnetic barrier goes into neutral, when the polarity shift happens, that plasma comes in. Right now, if you were able to, if the sky opened up and you had a spaceship and you were able to fly up there into the opening or the Sipapu or the Nibiru or the place of the crossing where you can cross over into the other worlds and stuff, um, and then you flew through that, you would go into what I call a plasma conduit, right? Which is a tunnel, basically, or a hallway of plasma that is swirling around our world and it keeps on going. It's not just around our world, it connects to other worlds, to other hubs of information and experience. So imagine you jumped into one and you were going to land into uh, the, some other world. Or let's say you were in another world coming to Earth. This is an idea of what you would see basically, right? You would be in this plasma vortex, aka Einstein Rosen Bridge, aka um, a wormhole. The reason it's called a wormhole is because the plasma looks like a worm. And they, they even used to call them sky worms or verms, right? So I actually put like, I put these extra graphics in there because that's the old North Pole land. This opening would be directly above the North Pole. So if you were coming down as an extraterrestrial, or if you were coming down as one of the watchers, or um, as as one of the Anunnaki or whatever, or the Anakim, uh, the fallen ones, the ones that floated down into this world, this is what it would look like from your perspective. As you get closer and closer to Earth, you're getting closer and closer to Rupus Negra, and that's where your landing spot is going to be. You're going to land on that holy mountain or that mountain that is set apart from all of the other ones. You're going to land in that area on that island somewhere. All right, cool. Oh, here's another example, right? Uh, speaking of these Einstein Rosen bridges and stuff and these, um, these what do they call them? Uh, wormholes, right? Speaking of these wormholes, every single time, many times when they're portrayed, I've noticed that they look like plasma, right? Even in Doctor Who, when he goes through or she sometimes goes through these uh, plasma uh, hallways or whatever to these other worlds via the TARDIS, uh, there's electricity that's involved, because we know subconsciously that there is electricity out there and that there are conduits and hallways of electricity or plasma that take us to other realms and connect our world to other worlds, right? So Donnie's in the classroom. He puts the slinky around his neck, which is really interesting because if he represents the central pillar, he now has two spiraling plasma vortices symbolically on either side of him, right? And uh, his teacher is answering his question about how to time travel. He says, well, you've got your vessel, your, your spacecraft or whatever. You've got your portal, your opening in the sky, and your vessel can be just about anything, most likely a spacecraft. But that's, that's his opinion, okay? But if you leave this world, it will become a, space, a spacecraft, whatever you're in. It automatically qualifies as a spacecraft because you'll be in space and you're in a craft, right? So... He says, your vessel can be just about anything. And Donnie says, like a DeLorean, a clear reference to Back to the Future, where you have to go 88 miles an hour in order to travel through time, right? The eight and the eight, the two boundaries, the anode and the cathode, the two pillars of Hercules, as we've talked about before, right? He says, like a DeLorean, he says, it's a metal craft of any kind. Well, that's interesting because earlier he says, uh, your vessel can be just about anything. He's like, oh, it, it, it could be anything? He's like, yeah, as long as it's made out of metal, then yeah, it could be anything. Why does it have to be made out of metal to be a time machine? Hmm, interesting. Because electricity is involved in this quote-unquote time travel, right? Um, which might not be what we thought it was. But regardless, you have to be inside of a metal craft. Why is that? Because you need protection from the electrical fields in those plasma conduits, right? Just like Doctor Who's TARDIS or, I mean, I don't know if that's made out of metal. I've never looked into it. But the DeLorean and uh, the time machine, right? All, all that stuff. Usually metal is involved because it creates a Faraday cage. It creates a protective barrier for you to safely sit inside of and traverse the fractalverse if you'd like to. So then his teacher gives him this book and it says, so check this out. I've got a book that's written by Roberta Sparrow and it's called, aka Grandma Death, The Philosophy of Time Travel. So Grandma Death, that almost gets hit by a car like every day and she's stuck in this loop, wrote a book all about time travel. She started teaching science right here at Middlesex, which is the Middle Saxons, right? As we talked about. And he goes home, he's like, wow, Grandma Death wrote a book. And then his mom, check this out. Now we're going to get deeper into Grandma Death's backstory. This is super interesting because it's a real backstory about stuff that's happened in our world. 
His mom, referring to Grandma Death, says, Yeah, she lives up there in that piece of crap house. Time out. Up there, meaning at the North Pole. In our world, okay, if we say up there, we're talking about the North Pole or north when you go up, right? Typically. In that piece of crap house. Why is it a piece of crap these days? We'll find out here in just a second. And she goes, you know, she's loaded. Well, that's interesting. See, the mom's kind of acting kind of base right now, right? She's like talking about the money and she's got a bunch of money or whatever. And she lives in that piece of crap house, et cetera, right? There's a lot of symbolic imagery that's happening that we're going to break down. Let's hear what the dad says. She used to be known for her gym collection, precious stones, coriander. Thank you. So, uh, Grandma Death used to be known for her precious stones or her gym collection. He even says kids used to go up there all the time and try to steal stuff from her. Why? Because she's loaded with all these precious gems and stuff, right? She's become a total recluse. Interesting. So we have Grandma Death, Roberta Sparrow, who represents this famous bright beam of light, essentially, um, or has something to do with that, right? She's directly related to Donnie Darko, who is that central pillar. So who could Grandma Death be? It looks like she's somebody who is in mourning. She looks like she's not doing too well. She's constantly checking on the post to see if it's uh, if she has any news or information. And uh, she's rich because she has these precious gems. And she's a total recluse. He even says, I didn't even know she was alive until we almost hit her with the car. So whoever she represents... Symbolically, our world has forgotten about Grandma Death. Our world has forgotten about whoever she represents symbolically, and she has something to do with all those things. Let's make some connections now. Check this out. This is a passage from an apocryphal book uh, that is not in the Bible or anything, but it's related to it. It's about Adam and Eve and, and uh, a little side story about their life. This is called The Book of the Cave of Treasures. Interesting. Check this out. I'm going to read it to you. It says here, uh, hold on, I'm just going to read it. And they shall place thee, so this is God talking to Adam, like Adam and Eve, right? They shall place thee, or you, inside of this cave, wherein I am making you dwell this day. So God made Adam live in a cave. Until the time when your expulsion shall take place from the regions of paradise, that means until the day that you are forced out of paradise or you leave this paradise island at the North Pole. Uh, let me start over. They shall place you in this cave where I am making you dwell until this day, until the time when your expulsion takes place from the regions of paradise to that earth which is outside of it. So the rest, the surrounding areas, right, where we live right now. And whosoever shall be left in those days shall take thy body with him and shall depo deposit it on the spot which I shall show him in the center of the earth. So there, here's a reference to the center of the earth and something to do with the cave. Let's read on. It says, And Adam and Eve went down uh, the spirit over the mountains of paradise, and they found a cave in the top of the mountain. And they entered and they hid themselves therein. So what is a mountain that has a cave in the top of it called? A volcano, right? Basically, uh, it's a plasma volcano, as you'll see. All right. It goes on and says, Adam carried Abel, who had died, to the cave of treasures and buried him inside of it. And he set, and he set right by him uh, and he put next to his body a lamp which burned day and night. So in this cave of treasures, Adam goes to bury his son and he puts this lamp that never goes out, an eternal lamp, exactly like Aladdin, okay? Aladdin goes into the cave of wonders or whatever, being the diamond in the rough or the, um, uh, the King Arthur type of a figure, the pure of heart, right? He's able to go in there. And here's an example, right? Inside of the cave of wonders in Aladdin, there's this steep cliff that he has to climb. Rupus Nigra is said as being a steep cliff. At the top of this steep cliff, for some unknown reason, is this bright blue beam that is shining straight up from the very top of this area. And that is where the magic lamp is. Lamp is just a fancy word for light. Um, it's also related to the word lamb, right? 
like the lamb of the world. Now, another reference, Pluto, the god of the underworld, death and riches. Let's check this one out. The god of the underworld, Pluto, or his Greek name, Hades, is considered the wealthiest god because the ground was so rich with minerals and precious metals. Pluto literally translates to the wealthy one. In ancient Roman culture, Pluto was the god of mortality and riches. He is the Roman version of Hades, god of death and the underworld. So Pluto is the god of mortality, which means death and riches. Are we seeing a connection yet to Grandma Death, right? Who is rich and she has all this precious uh, gems and stones. Let's check out another story called The Seven Sleepers. Here is an example. Here, I'll just show you the... It says the seven sleepers, and here's a picture that somebody made of this story. You have these people who fell asleep inside of a mountain. Let's check this story out real quick. So here, I'm, I'm going to par paraphrase it because it's a kind of a long story, and I'll read you this section here in just a bit. So basically what happened is a long time ago, there was these guys, and this is just my own words, okay? There was these guys who were very holy, they were very good, and they were total Christians, and they believed in the Redeemer and all this stuff hundreds of years ago, long time ago, right? And uh, the world was really evil. The world was bad. They didn't believe in the light. There was no goodness, just like in Donnie Darko's world. So these guys retreat to this mountain where they find a cave. They go inside of the mountain, inside of this cave, and fall into this deep slumber, into this deep sleep. When they awaken, over 300 years later, they come out of the cave to go get some food. And in their minds, they were just asleep for the night. And... And let me tell you the mind-blowing thing about this story. This story is in Islam. This story is in Christianity. This story is in so many avenues worldwide. I was surprised I had never heard of it. There are many references to this story under different names and different descriptors sometimes. But anyways, these guys go out into the world after their 300-year-long slumber, and they notice there's crosses everywhere, and there's all these signs of stuff that they believe in, and they're like, whoa, that's crazy. Like Everything looks all different. And uh, the people come. Oh, they were actually sealed inside of the cave too. That's a little side note. But uh, some people, some people come up to them and they say this. Um, oh, they, the people died soon after they had woken up from their three hundred year long nap. Basically, they were time travelers, right? This is uh, this is the story of um, man. What's that guy's name? Rip Van Winkle, right? Same type of deal. They fell asleep. They woke up super far into the future. And um, oh, I'm trying to I'm trying to keep it all together right here. So, oh, and then they died shortly after they had woke up or whatever, right? And then when they died, this is where this part picks up. It says the emperor wants to build golden tombs for them, but they appeared to the emperor in a dream and asked that they be buried in the earth in their cave, just like Adam and all of his firstborn. The cave is adorned with precious stones. See that? Which are called gems. A, a great church was built over this cave, cavernous mountain, and every year the Feast of the Seven Sleepers is kept. This is celebrated in many parts of the world today. It also gets into uh, symbolism that is commonly known as the king who is asleep in the mountain. The sleeping king inside of the mountain is a, a prominent folklore trope found in many folktales uh, folk and legends. Uh, it's also... It says some other designations are the king in the mountain, the king under the mountain, or uh, the sleeping hero. Some examples of this include, lo and behold, King Arthur, right? So King Arthur, Fionn Mac uh, Comal, Charlemagne, Ogier the Dane, King David, Frederick Barbosa, uh, some other people, Constantine. There's a whole list of people who are, you know, incorporated and cartoonified as, as being these characters who had fallen into some sort of a deep slumber and then one day they will wake up when they are needed most in the world and they'll come out of this mountain, out of this cave of wonders or cave of treasures to help the world. It's the cultural hero who is asleep in the mountain. Sometimes it's seen as a sleeping army, as it says right here. Man, it's hard to see. Let me zoom out all the way. 
Uh, man, you can't really see it there, but it says the Sleeping Army. It's that's too small to read. Anyways, very interesting stuff. The Sleeping Army one reminded me of the Lord of the Rings, right? Whenever they go into the mountain and there's that ghost army or whatever that was waiting for the right time to come out and help everybody. Same type of thing. Let's go to Laos. Remember earlier I mentioned Nico Laos, which is Nicholas, right? Laos means um people, the people basically, right? Uh, which is interesting because I just thought of The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, right? So many interesting connections. Uh, the Rock is the people's champion. That's very interesting. Laos means the people. Nico Laos means victory of the people. So if we go to the, the country of Laos, there is a story called the Spirit Guarded Cave. I'm going to read this to you real quick. When the people of the far north were... Now, this is in Laos, okay? Way away from the North Pole. When the people of the far north were molested by their foes, they were in continual fear and they consulted together saying, our lives are spent trying to escape from our enemies and no joy can be ours. Let's flee to the south countries where if people make slaves of us, at least we can know that our lives will be spared and our life, um, even in slavery, would be better than constant fear of our enemies destroying both ourselves and our dwelling places and taking our cattle for their own. Uh, let me make that smaller here. One man wiser than all the others says, why do we endanger our lives for our possessions? Right? Basically, they're like, hey, we shouldn't take all of this rich stuff that we have because they're, they're going to jump us and they're going to take all of our rich stuff too. So this is, this is not a good idea to bring all of our valuables, right? Why do we endanger our lives for our possessions? Can we not find some secret place in which to leave our money and our jewels? And when brighter days come to us, we can return and find them even as we had left them. All of the people said, your words are wise. Let's do this. And, uh, and as these people were loved of the spirits, they were led to a deep cave in the midst of a wood which means a forest, which is usually where this place is located. Okay, Mount Maru is said to be surrounded by a magical forest. Uh, they were led to a deep cave in the midst of a wood where a man, uh, where men seldom came. And there they had left their possessions in the care of the spirits who promised to guard them until the days when life being brighter and more secure, the owners would come and claim them. It goes on to say, the story became known and the inhabitants of all of the surrounding countries went to the cave and sought to take the treasure. Do not seek the treasure. I just thought of that. Uh, but such was the care of the spirits that no man with safety could enter the cave. A light was instantly extinguished if it let down into the deep pit leading into the chamber where the treasure was for the spirits blew their breath upon it and the light was no more. So there are some examples. Let me just make all of that really short form in case some of it went over you guys' head. Grandma Death represents Mount Maru, okay? She represents the, the goddess who is in constant mourning because she has lost her son. Her son is the light. She basically represents Mary, okay? So Mother Mary, all right, who gives birth to the light. Mount Maru is Mary. Mount Maru is the mother, Okay, Rupus Nigra, that, that magnetic mountain is the mother that shoots out that light or that sky beam. Okay, when the sky beam retracts, the mother is seen as going into mourning. And that is why we wear black when we're in mourning because of the black mountain, the dark mountain. Um, also, she's known as Black Demeter, right? One of these goddesses named Demeter. Now, let's see what Donnie Darko thinks about it because they're talking about Grandma Death at his therapist's office. And she says, well, what did... What did that make you think of whenever she said that everyone dies alone? And he says, it reminded me of my dog, Callie. This is interesting. His dog's name is Callie. There was a nymph named Callie. Now, a nymph is very similar in my mind, in my opinion, to like a sprite or a pixie or something like that. Basically, it's a light. Okay, it's a little plasma ball. All right. But in legends and lore, they're like little fairies and pixie. You know, they're cartoonified. Now, check this out. There was a nymph named Cali, right? Or at least the, the word Cali comes from this name. Uh, Cali comes from Calista. And it says, this is really interesting. This is sort of a side note, right? Uh, Calisto's story says, according to some writers, Zeus transformed himself. Zeus is a male figure. This is interesting. 
Zeus transformed himself into the figure of Artemis, who is a female goddess. Right? Check this out. To pursue Callisto, who is a female nymph. And she slept with him, believing Zeus to be Artemis. What does that mean about Callisto? Means she is a lesbian goddess. First time I've ever uh, in encountered that. I'm sure there's probably many references to, to stuff like that, but that was very interesting for me to read. However, I don't believe that his dog Callie is a direct reference to Callisto, the nymph. I actually think it's... Oh, here's a picture too. So check this out. It says Jupiter, same thing as Zeus, in the guise of Diana seducing Callisto. So he sees these two chicks staring at each other. That's what. That's that. <laughs> interesting, right? And it's interesting too because she got pregnant. That's super interesting. Zeus was with everybody, right? All right, now, Kali or Kali, or if you watch Indiana Jones, Kali Ma, right? Mother Kali. Uh, the etymology of Kali. Kali is the feminine form of time or the fullness of time with the masculine noun Kala, which, uh, which is the name of Shiva. By extension, uh, time as changing aspect or nature that brings things to life or death. So Kali, his dog, is is what he thought of when he had this conversation with Grandma Death, who represents time and loss and being in mourning because the blue beam came down and retracted, etc. Right. Also, time travel, and she wrote a book about the philosophy of time travel. Philosophy, like how do you feel about? time travel and stuff like that. The homonym Kala means an appointed time is distinct from Kala meaning black. So there's a word that means an appointed time or uh, Kala and then another word Kala, which means black. Interesting because she is the black mother. She is the black uh, goddess who is in mourning because she's the black mountain or plasma volcano. And there's many of these in the world. Okay. I'm talking, I'm just talking about the main one. Okay. The main one, like Mount Shasta is said to be full of these inner earth entrances and conduits and stuff that go down in these lava tubes and stuff. It's, it's really interesting. All right. Uh, but she became associated through popular etymology. She is called Kali Mata or the dark mother. Also Kali, which can be read here. Hold on which can be read here as a proper name or a description, the dark or the black one, Kali. Interesting. That's what he thought of when he thought of grandma death. She died, his dog died, when I was eight. There's the number eight again, right? The boundary marker. Um, really interesting. It's called the Chet. Now, his dog crawled underneath the porch to be alone. Right? His dog died. His dog crawled underneath the porch. That's symbolic. It goes underneath the world. It goes down and retracts down underneath the house, which is our world, right? All right. So we go back to Donnie Darko's house. Uh, they're all watching the Super Bowl. His buddy's over there with his dad. His Donnie Darko's dad, Eddie, is sitting right there. And you can see his dad's about to get up and get a beer. But there's this, there's this jelly stuff shooting out of his chest. Do you see that? These people cannot see it. They're just looking at him. But you're seeing what Donnie Darko sees, which is this, this worm, this plasma worm, basically, that shoots right out of his chest and it, it goes to go get the beer before he does, which is interesting. So he's just following it. He's following this energy that is shooting out and emanating from his solar plexus, from his chest. And then he sees his, his uh, sister and she's got one and she's following it around in circles. And he's cracking up because he's just loving this. And he sees one come out of himself. And he's like, oh, wow, this is interesting. So check this out. What is the characteristic of a plasmoid? Because basically this is plasma, right? That comes up out of people. This is also something that I referenced in the Soundgarden video, Black Hole Sun, whenever the plasma or the lightning or whatever it is, hits that baby carriage and it turns the baby into this, basically. Plasmoid characteristics. Plasmoid appears... Uh, plasmoids appear to be plasma cylinders that are elongated in the direction of the magnetic field. Plasmoids possess a measurable magnetic moment, a measurable speed, etc. This is real physical stuff that you can that you can interact with, right? And that's, this reminded me of this phenomenon that happened over Nuremberg. In Nuremberg, in what is it, 1561? Um, 
I'm going to read this real quick. A mass sighting of celestial phenomenon or unidentified flying objects occurred in 1561 above Nuremberg. Uh, this view is mostly dismissed by skeptics, some referencing Carl Jung's mid 20th century writings about the subject, while others find that the phenomenon is likely to be a sun dog. What are they talking about? They're talking about this woodcut picture. I think it's a woodcut. I don't know. It's an image that somebody had drawn of what they saw in the sky. This was in the newspapers, basically. <clears throat> I got to get a drink of it. I'm sorry. One second. So there was a celestial event in the 1500s that happened, and people drew a picture of what they saw in the sky, and here's what they saw. There was all of these spheres flying around all over the place, right around the sun, and in addition to these, spear, these spheres were these columns or these pillars or these cylinders of what I would say is plasma and plasma phenomena up there in the sky. As you can see, sometimes you have a cross, just like we saw with that those coins where they have like the cross with the little balls on them, right? Uh, which represents the fruit of the gods. And that fruit is falling, it's flying around in the sky, acting all crazy. And then some of that fruit actually goes down to the ground and sets it on fire because it's electromagnetic in nature, right? It says cylindrical objects, which were several small, uh, cylindrical objects from which several small spheres emerged and darted around the sky at dawn. Interesting. And then immediately we have Donnie Darko looking up into the sky, right? I think they had heard an airplane p pass by, so he's kind of cautious about airplanes after, you know, the jet engine fell into his room. The jet broke through his house, okay? Remember, like a jet is like a, a fountain, something that jets out of something. All right, so we go back to Donnie Darko's bathroom, and there's a flash of lightning. There's a storm coming, which typically means that the, the world is coming to an end, symbolically speaking. All right, so boom, we got the lightning that flashes. And uh, meanwhile, his therapist is actually talking to his parents, and she's saying that he's having hallucinations, basically. Now, he's back at that barrier. Remember that force field? And he's got a knife, and he's trying to push it right through there, but it's not working because it's a physical barrier. And he keeps on hitting it, and he hits it, and he keeps hitting it. And every time he hits it, it causes a light. There's like a spark, right? And he's hitting it exactly where the eye is on Frank. He's putting out one of Frank's eyes symbolically before it actually happens. And then every time he does it, Frank's eye that he's hitting with that knife lights up, right? This is the eye of, this is the one eye symbolism of so many different sky gods out there. And Frank is no exception, right? And this is the exact same light that you saw at the beginning of the movie when it said Donnie Darko. And there was that flash in the sky. This is the eye in the sky uh, that's symbolized by Frank. And then there's lightning all over the place just to further solidify that we're talking about electromagnetic phenomenon. So boom, Donnie's like, he's trying to get through to Frank. He's trying to, he's trying to get in touch with Frank, basically. Now, let's go to the dude with the bad energy. What was his name? Jim Cunningham, right? So Jim is a guest speaker at the school. He's an author on these crazy books, these stupid books, Attitudinal Beliefs is the name of one of his books. He comes in. Now, check this out. You could probably relate to a lot of this. He says, good morning, you mongrels. That is the name of the school mascot, is the mongrel. So all of these children at this school are called mongrels, which is not really like uh, a complimenting term. It's not something that's like, you know, if you call somebody a mongrel, it's not usually like taken as a compliment. But here he comes in and he's like, good morning, mongrels. I'm super positive. Hey, mongrels. What's up, mongrels? Right? This is symbolic of our world being flipped upside down where good is evil and evil is good. And, he, and uh, the word mongrel just means to be mixed, just so you know. So remember how we talked about that there was those, uh, those tribes that once lived on that island at the North Pole, right? And then barriers go up and they stay there for a while and everybody else is kind of kept out <coughs> if you don't have that matching energy. And um, they stay there and they populate and they have their own little tribes and stuff like that. But whenever they leave, they go and they mix and they spread out amongst the nations and they become the lost tribes. So he says, good morning, you mongrels. Uh, mongrel, I already talked about means to mix or to be a mixture. And then the whole crowd goes, good morning, good morning or whatever. And he goes, is that all, is that all you can muster? I said, good morning. They're like, good morning. 
And he's like, nah, that's a tiny, tiny bit better. But I still sense that some students out there who are actually afraid to say good morning. And then everyone's like, good morning, good morning. But look at Donnie Darko's face. Whoops. Uh, nah, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> That's me. Okay. This has happened to me so many times. I'm sure it's happened to many of you. This is the type of thing that they train us to do. Okay. This is, this is a school for spell casting is what you're, you're watching this in action. Okay. He is an evil, dark magician. Okay. In real life, there are people just like this who practice casting dark negative spells at people in this upside down Harry Potter ass world that we live in right now. He comes in and th this happens in real life. And what they're doing is they're trying to get you to already open a door, to already participate, to already be on their side, to already start saying yes, and to basically be subservient and already just do what you're told. He said, good morning. That doesn't mean you have to say good morning back to him. You know what I mean? That's nonsense. What he's doing is it's a trick. It's a spell that is cast to your mind. He's like, good morning. And then he stops. And then, and then there's like this expectancy because of the, because of the collective energy that's already existing in the school or in our world today. And then there's a sort of peer pressure to sort of meet that. Well, his energy is evil. So if you meet it, you're going to meet it with evil basically. Right. And he's trying to get everybody on the same page. He's trying to get them to turn against themselves just in case somebody doesn't go with the flow and say, good morning, right back to him. You don't have to say that. What if it's not a good morning? What if your morning sucks? What if you had a crappy morning? It's not a good morning. You know what I mean? That's the type of that's the type of fair, balanced mindset that Donnie Darko has. So he's hesitant to say good morning. He's not going to do it, basically, which I congratulate him for. Now, he says, uh, there was a young man searching for love in all the wrong places. And then he, he, he has this voice, okay? You can tell there's some people that are charged, man. Good or bad, they're charged. And you know how you can tell they're charged with a lot of energy? Because they're usually really good speakers, okay? It doesn't mean that if you're not a good speaker, you don't have like a soul or anything. But typically, um, the ancient myths and legends said that uh, if you were to put the sacred honey of the sacred bees onto your lips, it would actually imbue you with the power of speech. Like you would be a great public presenter like this guy right here. Except it all depends on what energy is already existing. It amplifies it. So if he's got bad energy, it's going to be amplified. If he has good energy, it'll be amplified, right? So he says there was a young man searching for love in all the wrong places. His name was Frank. Oh, just like the bunny rabbit, right? Frank, the free man searching for love in all of the wrong places. Now, I will say this, just because he's evil doesn't mean that everything he says is a lie. He does lie a lot, but I don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Oftentimes, they throw a little bit of truth in there so that the lie is believable. There is a group of people or free people, the Franks, you could call them symbolically, um, who have left their home the paradise, and we are looking for love, our true love, in all of the wrong places, physically here on earth, okay? There is a place that is the right place to look for love, to fall back in love, etc., which is the Garden of Eden. Now he says his name is Frank. Donnie Darko's like, ah, I'm listening now. Go on, <laughs> right? Okay, I totally know a rabbit named Frank. Can I talk? So anyways, this little kid gets up and he's like, what do I do to learn how to fight? Right? So this, this kid's asking advice and he goes, young man, son, violence is a product of fear. Well, that's bull crap. Okay. Sometimes you need to be violent in order to protect yourself or your loved ones or whatever. Just like Donnie said, there's a whole spectrum and there's things to take into consideration. Just because there's violence doesn't mean it's automatically evil. There's two sides or three if you take the neutral route. Donnie listens to this crap and he decides, I'm going to volunteer. And he goes, hey, good morning. Good, mo good morning. Hey, everyone. Good morning. Now he wants to say good morning because now he has something to talk about. Now he has something to believe in, right? Now he has something that he supports, which is his message. He's like, I'm going to do that whole good morning thing right back to you. I'm going to throw that back your way, Jim Cunningham. He says, um, uh, how much are they paying you to be here? Whoa throws a wrench right into his system. And Jim Cunningham's like, uh, excuse me, what? And all the teachers are all looking and everyone's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And there's this vibe. Remember how I talked about the vibe that we put off from our heart energy when someone walks in the room with a different vibration, right? That's exactly what's happening right now. He feels the vibe. He probably sensed it before, but once it was manifested, 
<laughs> and you could see like the, his, he, he, Ooh, man, the energy grew in Donnie Darko gets up there. He's like, how much are they paying you to be here? And he's like, let's talk about things you don't want to talk about. He goes, well, what, excuse me, what? I'm sorry. He says, and then he starts talking to those people that, that were, that were asking questions. So he specifically talks to that kid who wants to learn how to fight. He says, if you're sick of some jerk shoving you, your head down the toilet, uh, maybe you should like take a karate class or kick him in the balls the next time he tries to do it. Right. And, uh, then he looks at Jim Cunningham and he goes, I, I think you're the antichrist basically. So he's escorted off the, off the stage and he's the antichrist. Okay. It's the opposite. We're in the upside down world and that's good pretending to be bad and bad pretending to be good. It's crazy. Uh, then let's see. Oh, then we go to the, the science teacher, Monotov. And they're talking about time travel once more. And he says, each vessel travels along a vector. A vector is basically a straight line, okay? Through space-time along its center of gravity. And Donnie's like, like a spear. Now remember, Roberta Spiro, the spear, right? He says, like a spear. That's interesting. Like a spear that comes out of your chest because he's seen this plasma stuff come out of his chest and other people's chest. And he goes like, yeah, yeah, sure. It could be that. He's like, you know what? They start talking about God. They, they bring God into it and faith and stuff. The teacher starts getting kind of nervous because he's like, I, I can't have this conversation with you. I could lose my job. And Donnie's like, all right, I, I get it. You know? So he goes home and he tries to think about it while he's thinking he's playing with this little Rubik's cube. But I never noticed this until, until today. Check this out. He marked out all the colors on the Rubik's cube with a black marker. So he's trying to figure out the world that he lives in, which is the black cube or the dark city that we live under, the black box, Pandora's box, the container. And he's sitting there just twisting this black Rubik's cube uh, while he's pondering things. So he goes for a walk and he stops and he actually finds a wallet. Guess who it belongs to? It belongs to that Jim Cunningham dude. Check this out. Here's another interesting. Remember, because he, he, that was his exact scenario. Okay. These are signs and omens. Pay attention to what's going on in your life. Even the most insignificant things, um, are, they touch everything else. Everything is touching everything else. It's all related and interconnected. And therefore you can learn to read the future. You can learn to predict things accurately just by paying attention to the world that you live in. Right? So Donnie Darko was handed that card that said, Ling Ling is going to find a wallet. Donnie Darko finds a wallet. I'm pretty sure he took money. If there, it, it didn't say he took money, but anyways, let's check, let's let's zoom in on this real quick. I want to show you his birthday. Jim Cunningham's birthday is May fifteenth, the Ides of May, nineteen fifty five. Nineteen fifty five is also the date that keeps on coming up in Back to the Future. I thought that was an interesting coincidence, right? It also makes five five five, five five five, which. Is really interesting. I'm going to talk about 555 here in a bit. So in the book, they actually show, Roberto Sparrow's book talks about this uh, this this chakra energy, this, this plasma energy that comes out of the body. And here's some images of it in her book here. Now, they're doing a presentation in their science class and they have this thing that they came up with. They have to come up with these inventions to help mankind. And theirs was called the infant memory generator, which is to, it's a device used to help infants or children to to retain their memories right which is directly related to the apocalyptic scenario because when we go through this worldwide depressurization worldwide collectively the world experiences for the most part amnesia many people wake up after the apocalypse who have survived some people will actually sleep through the apocalypse believe it or not uh, but some people will wake up and they'll have amnesia they'll have no idea who they are how they got there where they are you know what i mean it'll be all brand new to them so that's just a, a call out to that. And then they show you the classroom. And I actually want to show you what's in the background. You see the whiteboard in the background that caught my eye. Those shapes caught my eye. I wanted to zoom in on those. This one sort of looked like a tor toroidal field, right? But this one, I had to look this up. At first, I was like, these kind of look like the owl eyes or the plasma balls on either side of the squatter man stick figure. So I looked it up. Let's take a look at this. This is an interesting little side note. And this is the image that you saw drawn on the, uh, on the whiteboard, right? So see this little figure eight type deal? That's what was drawn back here. This is directly related to chaos theory, which is also super interesting stuff. Um, it says here, uh, the Lor Lorenz attractor, 
which is what this, this little figure is called, or this equation is called. The Lorenz attractor is a set of chaotic solutions of the Lorenz system. Now, pay attention. Check this part out. In popular media, the butterfly effect stems from the real-world implications of the Lorenz attractor, namely that in a chaotic physical system, which is called Earth, okay? Keep that in mind chaotic physical system. In the absence of perfect knowledge of the initial conditions, even the minuscule disturbance of the air due to a butterfly flapping its, its wings, our ability to predict the future, uh, our ability to predict the future course will always fail. What does that mean? That means if we do not understand how something originated or how it began, and we don't have the perfect knowledge of the beginnings of things, we can never, ever predict the future of those things accurately. We will always fail at predicting the future, right? Let me read this a little bit more and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expound upon it. This underscores that physical systems can be completely deterministic and yet still be inherently unpredictable. The shape of the Lorenz attractor itself, when plotted in phase space, may also be seen to resemble a butterfly or the number eight, right? Sideways, the infinity sign. This actually moves and creates all kinds of different shapes. But let's go back to that. If we don't understand, if we have no memory or recollection of how things began here on Earth, Chaos theory says all of your predictions are meaningless, okay? They're all destined to fail, basically, okay? Because you don't have all of the information. If you had all of the information, if you had a, a collective memory, if we collectively had the memory of things we're talking about now, of our esoteric hidden history or forgotten past, then that is going to amplify uh, our ability to more accurately predict what is to come because it's repetitive as well. Very interesting stuff. Chaos theory. It also reminded me of uh, Jurassic Park. They had the K. Remember Dr. Malcolm on Jurassic Park? He's like, I'm a chaos -tician or whatever. Like, what was he doing there? You know what I mean? Like, that was, that didn't make a lot of sense until just now whenever I read about this. All right, so the math teacher says, didn't you stop and think that infants need darkness? Because they put on these glasses and it just makes them, it's like light images while they're sleeping. So the teacher's like, didn't you stop and think that maybe infants need darkness? That maybe darkness is a part of their natural development, right? We are the infants that they're symbolically talking about, right? We need the darkness as a part of our natural development. We need to go through the fires and the tribulations and stuff so we can be reborn, so that we can become better and grow, right, for our development. All right, so Donnie takes his girlfriend to the movie theater. It's totally Halloween, so there's like some Halloween flicks. They say The Evil Dead. I'm probably going to watch this movie tonight. I have not seen The Evil Dead. <laughs> it's come up so much in my research, but I still haven't watched it. I'm, I'm probably going to go watch it tonight. Apparently, it's about a bunch of people being plasma possessed and turning into killers. I don't know. I'm going to check it out. All right. So the evil dead. Also, look at the symbolism back here. You see this? I don't know if this was done purposefully. It probably was because it's a movie set. But see, you've got the X and then the circle there in the middle. And it almost looks like like this one right here, like a pyramid and then a circle on the top, right? Like, a, like the all seeing eyes and the unfinished pyramid type deal. All right. So lo and behold, Frank is in the movie theaters with Donnie. His girlfriend passes out. That's appropriate because when Donnie and Frank meet, it symbolizes the apocalypse or an apocalyptic situation. And she passes out, which is what happens during the apocalypse, mostly because of the depressurization of the atmosphere. People can't breathe and they pass out. Anyways, she's passed out while they're watching a movie. And he goes, why do you wear that stupid bunny suit? And Frank looks over at him and he goes, why are you wearing that stupid man suit? Donnie's like, okay, why don't you take off your mask? He takes off his mask and boom, he's missing an eye exactly in the same spot where he was hacking away at it with the knife earlier. And he goes, there's something I want to show you. And this is the movie theater screen. It's hard to see right there. Um, but this portal starts opening up in the movie theater screen. See when it opens, it's on the clock, right on that clock, the timepiece, a portal opens. 
Kamau Nia. Hey, welcome to my channel. Good to see you. All right, so this portal starts opening up in the movie theater screen, and he says, have you ever seen a portal? And this portal starts to open up. Interesting that they put these specific images, and they put that portal opening up right between the eyes right there too, right? And then the clock, right? Time travel, etc. And then the whole screen dissolves, and it shows you Jim Cunningham's house where he picked up that wallet. He goes, burn it to the ground. He didn't say it that like I did. He's like, burn it to the ground. He's very calm. All right. And then, uh, so Don Darko was like, okay, sure. Why not? I'll go burn that crap down. So he goes and he, he's basically going to go burn that dude's house down. And then I wanted to show you the movie theater because one, the theater is called Arrow, which is interesting, like, like a beam or a stock or an arrow, right? It says the evil dead. It's Halloween, but they're showing the last temptation of Christ as well. That's because Christmas and Halloween are interrelated. They're about the same things, which is apocalyptic events. All right, we go back to the school. They're actually having a talent show right now. It says 88. There's more 88 symbolism because the, the year takes place in 1988. And uh, there's this bunch of girls that get up on stage and they're going to do their little sparkle motion dance. And they're just doing this, this performance where it's a bunch of like really young girls that are, for me, it made me feel awkward. I didn't like, I don't like it because of the characters of stuff that's happening in here. But basically like they, they, they dress up these little girls and they put makeup on them and stuff and they have them acting all sort of sexual and stuff. Super inappropriate in my, in my personal opinion. Okay. That's just me. Uh, but sparkle motion, they get up there, they start dancing and stuff and, uh, performing. Now this is a talent show. So actually right before they went on, there was this other girl that she went on and she was doing this whole ballerina thing with like angels and stuff. It's, it's going to come back in just a minute. I'll show you what I mean. So while they're doing that, Donnie goes to Patrick Swayze's house. As you can see in the background, there's like this painting and he's got a can of gas and he's like, <laughs> he starts putting the gas all over everything. He's going to burn it down. Now, symbolically, this Donnie Darko represents the apocalypse. Okay. When that beam makes its appearance and when it disappears and stuff, that's when the apocalypse happens. We already saw the water one. They already told you there was a fire one before that. So the next thing to happen is this, it's got to be another fire because we already had the water, the school flooded, right? The world flooded. So now we're going to have the house burning down, which is symbolically our world burning down the evil world. I should say burning down. Okay. The evil world gets cleansed through fire. We live in the evil world right now, so guess what's coming next? All right, so he pours gasoline on everything. It burns down everything, including that picture of Patrick Swayze in the background, which reveals that there was a secret room in the background right behind this portrait. It opens up. Meanwhile, Sparkle Motion's doing their little thing for everybody. And then this girl, this girl who had just done her performance is sitting in front of the mongrel statue outside. She's really sad because nobody likes her. They always pick on her. And it's crazy because the parents allow it. The teachers allow it. People are always picking on this girl. I forgot her name. Um, but she says, shut up. Right? That's the girl that says, shut up. Um, and here's the thing. The people would rather in this world that we live in, which is symbolically represented by Donnie Darko's whole, whole world. Okay. In this world that we live in, sadly, people would rather see this then this, this girl was dressed up as an angel and she's not showing any skin or anything. She doesn't have makeup or anything. Lori. Hey, good to see you, Lori. Um, and so anyway, she's out there by herself with the statue or whatever. And it's really sad. Actually makes me sad. Um, now the next day on the news, it says here, uh, the blaze, the fire was extinguished sometime after eight o'clock last night. Eight o'clock. There you have it again. The number eight symbolism, right? Time travel, the number eight, the chaos theory thing. It's all coming into play. Uh, and then they say that they found, I don't think I can say this word without getting demonetized or my, <laughs> my video removed, uh, but you can read it yourself. But they found super inappropriate stuff uh, having to do with children and stuff in that secret room that, of, um, of Jim Cunningham when the house burned down. So when, when Donnie Darko burned the house down, they found this little secret room that has this stuff in it. Right. And his sister's like, Oh my God. And he says that Jim Cunningham was arrested early this morning. And then meanwhile, Oh shoot. Drew Barrymore is about to lose her job. Dang. Check this out. So meanwhile, Drew Barrymore, she's, she's got all these different methods. Remember I saw how I was saying she's trying to get the kids to think outside of the box. Right. 
uh, she's in the principal's office about to get fired. She's going to get the boot. So she says, what exactly about my methods do you find inappropriate? She's such a cutie pie. I love her. Uh, he says, oh, and then she goes on to say, we're losing these kids to apathy. Apathy is when you don't have feelings about stuff, right? Which is, which is happening in our world today. Okay. Generation Z, as they're known, uh, are basically known for being the most apathetic generation of all of them, right? They don't have, they're very desensitized. They don't have a lot of emotion and feelings about things because the world is changing so fast that nothing's, nothing surprising. There's not like morals start to basically fall apart. And that's, this is the world that we live in today. She says, we're losing them, them to apathy and this prescribed nonsense. She's talking about the school system and academics. Prescribed nonsense, right? They're not, we're not teaching kids how to survive. We're not teaching kids how to grow plants and food. Fudge. Grow food out of the earth. You know what I mean? You don't learn that until like high school. And then even then you have to take a special class to do it, right? We're not teaching kids important things. We're not teaching them about death. We're not teaching them about life. We're not teaching them about the spirit or the soul. We're not teaching them about energy and vibration and plasma. Shoot, plasma? Kids don't even know about plasma. To, to them, that's like a magical, mysterious video game thing, like plasma guns and stuff, right? They don't even know about it. And then they have the, the gall and the audacity to call plasma like the, what was it, the fourth state of matter or something. Like basically, they made it the last one because it's the last one that they found out about when really it's the initial state of matter. She says they're slipping away and that's what's happening in our world today. So this is a huge sign for all of us in the world. He says, I'm sorry that you have failed. Hmm, this is what happens in the world today. When you're good living and surrounded by evil, evil will look you in the eye and say, you did something wrong. Okay. When in reality, you did something right, but to evil, right is wrong. See what I'm saying? He's like, I'm sorry that you have failed. So usually this is what I see is that evil people will point the finger super quick uh, to find fault with other people and say, oh, you messed up. You failed. When in reality, she's doing something good. She's doing something positive, right? So she gets fired. She goes outside and just lets it out. God. She just screams. And I have had moments like this many times. I've had to leave work. I've done exactly that. Uh, I've probably done that in school at some point. I've done this many times in life, right? Just, you just want to say that. You just want to just yell at the sky like, God dang it, man. When's it going to get better, right? This movie is actually all about things getting better. Believe it or not, that's the crescendo. They show you all the bad stuff. They show you how terrible the world is in order to have us appreciate the change that is coming. Okay. Now they hold up the newspaper. They show that their, their idol just got arrested for some nasty stuff. Uh, Donnie Darko decides to write Roberto Sparrow a letter, which I love. I just personally love that. I love that he decided to put, to put something in the mail, which means the world's about to change. Okay. Because she's going to check the mailbox and there's going to be news. There's going to be information. It's going to be full. Okay. The world will be full instead of being empty right now. Our mailbox is empty, meaning that the world is empty of energy. The world is empty of magic. One day it will refill. It will be filled back up. And we'll go back into a golden age. So the teacher had written cellar door and Donnie Darko was like, what does cellar door mean? And she says, cellar door is, is uh, the most beautiful of all the combinations of words that you can make. I think that's very interesting. That's actually true. Uh, the guy, Tolkien said that, I believe, who wrote Lord of the Rings. He was talking about the most beautiful words, cellar door, right? Even more beautiful than the word beautiful. I love it. I also think it's symbolic of Mount Maru, which is our cellar door of our world, right? And so Donnie Darko sitting there, cellar door, and they make a point of that. And I believe that that's what they're talking about. And I, and I think they actually confirm that later on when we see Grandma Death's uh, basement. So we are back into Dr. Thurman's office and she says, what did you want for Christmas that year? She's talking about some past Christmas. Remember, Christmas and Halloween directly interconnected, very much related to one another, apocalyptically speaking, right? What did you want for Christmas that year, Donnie? He goes, hungry, hungry hippos. And at first you might just think it's, you know, nothing, whatever. Like they just came up, they just put some random toy in there for the sake of the movie. Not true. They specifically chose hungry, hungry hippos. 
because of the sound that it makes three times in a row. The H sound, that he, he, he sound. Just like when we broke down the movie Nope and we talked about Haywood's Hollywood horses, the het or the hey. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other. Which actually, in this one, you can actually see that it's the ancient Phoenician letter het. Fat Albert is known for saying, hey, hey, hey. Santa is known for saying, ho, ho, ho. What's going on with all these H, H sounds three times in a row? Ghostbusters, five, five, five. What does that have to do with hey, 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 ho, 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 all that stuff? Well, this is the ancient symbol for the letter that makes the sound ha. Okay? It is a, a figure of a guy putting his hands up into the air. And what it, what it conveyed, it conveyed many things, but one of those things was spirit. Okay? Because this is the stick figure image. This is the beam that shoots up. Right? It curves around that middle that middle beam, creates an arc, an electrical arc, shoots up as a central beam, and then it spreads back out with the eye in the sky in the central portion, creating the stick figure man, the squatter man, etc. And if you do that three times in a row, you've got the three beams in the middle of the world. Hey, here's what it looks like. Here's uh here's just an example here. So in early Hebrew, right, it's the psi symbol. It looks like a psi right? With the three beams shooting up out of it, coming out of the earth there. Uh, and then it, it was just changed into various shapes over time. But originally it was a picture. All of these letters were glyphs or pictures of things. And it was a picture of a guy putting his hands up in the air, which symbolizes peace, which symbolizes I come in peace, right? You know what I mean? Uh, life, peace, etc. And then here's the other ones. Today, it's more like a, a, a crack in a house or a window that allows spirit to come in or wind to come in, etc. <clears throat> All right. So Donnie's back into in the therapist's office and he goes, I can see him right now. And he looks and he sees that it's Frank. Frank's looking right at him. And then Frank goes, looks straight up at the sky. You know how many times people looked up in the sky in this movie? So many times. So he looks up and then it actually flashes a sky in Donnie Darko's vision or whatever, right? And Donnie tells his therapist, the sky's going to open up. And she says, she's trying to comfort him. <laughs> he should be comforting her, really, because she has no idea. She says, if the sky were to suddenly open up, there would be no law. There would be no rule. There would only be you and your memories. She's actually trying to say this to comfort him, implying the sky is not going to open up. That can't happen, right? But she's actually right. If the sky opens up, or I should say, when the sky opens up, there will be no law. It will be apocalypse. It will be the law of the land. It will be do as you like to do. There will be no rule. That's also true. You will rule yourself, however you see fit, however long that lasts for. There will only be you and your memories. This is the movie speaking to us, letting you know what to expect after the apocalypse. All right, so Donnie's having a party at his house because his parents are gone and stuff. Um, then he sees those little plasma worms sticking out of everybody's chests and he's just tripping. He's just looking, I mean, he's not on drugs or anything. He's just, he can see it. Okay. He's gifted and he can see where everyone is going to go because he can see into the spirit world or the electromagnetic spectrum. If you had the vision of plasma, this is probably what it's something like what you would see. Okay. You would, you would see all kinds of interesting and brand new things. So he's staring at everything. And then right around the corner, there's actually some, this plasma worm that comes right at him and it goes through him, right through his face, actually. And, uh, his, his face pops into it. His eyes get all super huge. <laughs> um, and he, he looks into the plasma conduit itself. And then it shows you like the sky and how like the plasma conduits kind of moving through the sky and stuff like that. And then it ends up this huge sunlight or something. And then all of a sudden you see his girlfriend, Gretchen, and she's looking straight down at Donnie Darko, who is down by her belly. And they just hooked up in the bedroom upstairs. So it doesn't really say this, but I'm pretty sure she's pregnant. Okay. Uh, I don't really have a lot to say about that, but I'm pretty sure that's what's going on and why he's down there. So all of a sudden he stands up and he's like, we got to go. Look, we got to go. Now, time out real quick. Backstory on her. Her father stabbed his mom, her mom in the chest 
exactly where that plasma stuff comes out of four times. They mentioned that earlier in the movie, right? Donnie Darko sees the plasma stuff and all of a sudden when he snaps out of it, he's looking right in her like, you know, belly chest area, her, her, uh, solar plexus area. And he snaps out of it. And all of a sudden he's like, we got to go. Right. So possibly I'm just, I'm super speculating. Right. But possibly he could have seen a future where he lost his mind and he stabs her in order to get rid of that plasma stuff. Or I don't know. It's possible. I'm just throwing that out there. All right, let's move on. Anyways, he's like, we got to go. He says, time is running out. We got to go. He's talking to us. He's talking to all of us. We got to go. Well, where do we got to go? Right? Time's running out because the apocalypse is quickly coming. That clock is counting down to midnight right now as I make this live stream on Halloween 2022. The clock is running out. We got to go. And they go, where do they go? Well, they go to Grandma Death's house. That's the place of safety, right? That is Mount Maru, symbolically speaking, as we've already broken it down. That's the cave of wonders, the cave of treasures. That's the safe haven. That is Hold Mimi's Holt. That is the rabbit hole. So they get to Grandma Death's house and he goes, huh, cellar door. And then that, this is actually up here is the top. This is like her floor. So this is her cellar. This is her basement. And there's a door right there. Um, they go inside, but they actually are met by some bullies. And the bullies are there. Seth Rogen, is that Seth Rogen? And uh, anyway, so the bullies take off their masks. They jump on, on top of them and... Uh, they're fighting each other, basically. It's kind of hard to see. But then a car pulls up, and the car's coming towards them. And then Donnie is, has a knife to his neck, and he, all of a sudden he starts speaking in tongues or in a different language. And he says, Deus, uh, Deus ex machina. Excuse me, one moment. Deus ex machina, which means God out of the machine, I believe, something like that. God out of the machine, which is really interesting because you literally have Frank who's driving this car, which is a machine, and Frank is seen as a type of God figure in the movie. And he says, Deus ex machina, our savior. So it comes. And the car is about to actually run into grandma death. She likes to be hit by cars apparently, right? Which is really interesting because Marty McFly was hit by a car in Back to the Future in another time traveling deal, right? Anyways, Grandma Death is standing in the middle of the road. The car swerves to avoid her and instead runs over Gretchen, snapping her neck and she dies. This car also, it's, it's of note, is a Thunderbird which is the same as a phoenix, basically, which is the same as the, the light that comes up and stuff, right? So the car runs her over, she dies. Uh, and then you can see that the driver of the car was this dude in a bunny suit named Frank. That's where Frank comes from. Frank kills Donnie Darko's girlfriend. And he's like, wake up, wake up. And Frank's standing there. He's like, what are you guys doing in the middle of the road? What's wrong with you? And Donnie's like, he is not happy. And he has a gun. I forgot to mention that, but earlier he found a gun in his parents' closet. So Frank's like all trying to like throw the blame back at Donnie, which is a total evil thing to do. And that's very common in this world that we live in is people like to throw the blame back at... Remember like when uh, whenever we were talking about Lord of the Rings and they were climbing up that super steep cliff to try to go back to the, the volcano or whatever. And Schmeagel was trying to blame... Uh, the hobbit, the other, the little pudgy hobbit, right? Trying to blame him for eating all of the Lembus bread, right? And then uh, he sprinkled the crumbs all over him and stuff. And Smeagol starts like blaming him, even though he's the one that did it. That's exactly what happened. God, that happens so much in our world today. <laughs> Blows my mind. So Donnie takes out the gun and blasts Frank uh, right in the eyeball. So that's where that image comes from, right? Now check this out. The actual Frank, that's not the actual Frank that Donnie's been seeing this entire time. The actual Frank is the exact same guy in the exact same bunny suit or whatever that is allegedly like out of time, basically. So sort of a, a type of time traveler as well. All right, so the next day, Donnie picks up his dead girlfriend, Gretchen, um, and this is him sort of acting as the superhero, okay? I know she's dead, but he's going to bring her back to life. As well, he should because of what he represents, as we've discussed. Now, over the White House, a storm starts to form. This plasma vortex. This looks a lot like Black Hole Sun by Soundgarden, right? This huge storm forms right above the house. And he looks up into the storm. There's sort of this like...
plasma tentacle cloud thing that goes and he drives, he takes off. He doesn't want to be home because he just totally killed somebody. And he goes exactly to the place or, or near the place where the, the beginning of the movie started. And you can see in the background, there's like this tornado, right? Um, this is, this would be like the symbolic of the world tornado or the tornado of Dorothy, Dorothy's tornado from the wizard of Oz that sucks, sucks everything up and takes you to another world. That's the tempest. Basically it's the worldwide storm that happens. So he sees the tornado and the parents are about to fly right through that because they're on an airplane right now. Donnie starts to laugh. Now we see the mom and the sister in the airplane. And all of a sudden you hear Donnie's science teacher and he says, your vessel can be just about anything metal craft of any type. They're inside of a plane. The cabin of a plane is a metal craft. It is a Faraday cage purposefully designed that way so that when it's flying through the air and it's hit by lightning, the lightning goes right through it or around it, leaving everyone inside unharmed by the electricity. And it goes right down to the ground and it grounds itself, right? So everyone inside is protected from the electricity while they're time traveling, right? Or while they're going through some sort of vortex or hole in the sky. So the plane starts shaking and stuff. People are screaming. And this dot right here you can see is the jet engine. And also you can actually make out a blue beam that is shooting up into the air. I didn't really see it the first time, but now the more I look at it, I can kind of see there's this bluish white light that's shooting up into the air right there. Donnie looks at his dead girlfriend and he smiles because first and foremost, he does, he knows she's not dead. Okay. He knows that he's, she's about to come back to life and he hears her voice and she says, what if you could go back in time and take all of those hours of pain and darkness and replace them with something better. This is the whole, this is the crux of the movie. So I really want to drive this point home. Okay. All the other stuff was int interesting and entertaining to watch and stuff, but the crux of the movie, the important part of the movie is that hope. Remember how we started things off with Pand Pandora's box and all of the evils were let out of the box, which sim symbolizes our world as well. The one thing that was kept inside of that box was hope. Okay. So this is the hope portion. You need the hope. We need this hope in the world that we live in today with the energy going the way that it's going. The world's going to hell. It's terrible. I mean, in a handbasket, like it's, it's quickly falling apart at the seams. We need that hope. Don't lose hope because everything's going to change. Freight train. Hey, good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. Appreciate you. Uh, so what is she saying? She's saying, don't you wish you could go back in time and change it and make it all better? If you are a survivor of the next apocalyptic event, it's all going to start over, which means you are now back in time and you can now affect the future. You can affect right now, symbolically speaking, or maybe even actually speaking, right? And change the world and make it how you would like to see it, you know, how, how you would like to see the world instead of it being the terrible mess that it is. All right, so then they show you the plasma conduit and the little uh, jet thing that's flying through the plasma conduit. Also, I just want to mention this too. During the apocalypse, not only will stuff from our world get sucked up in, in uh, the supersonic winds, or I don't know if they're supersonic, but super fast winds. Uh, everything's going to be floating up into the sky. Stuff will get sucked up into the sky. Some stuff will get sucked out of our sky. But remember, just beyond our sky is are those plasma conduits that lead to other worlds that are having their plasma apocalypse and their sky is temporarily open for like a week or maybe three days. I don't know how long uh, exactly. But my point is debris from our world may land in some other alternate earth with an exact DNA replica pattern, an exact uh, in information pattern uh, coding or whatever. And we might have stuff that lands in their world that does not belong in their world, but it's got, it shares an energy signature with the things that are in our world because they're alternate earths basically. So it's, it's also likely that other debris from other worlds will fall down into our world and people will go looking for it, right? Which gives rise to, uh, the quest for all of the holy relics and whatnot. All right. So anyways, Donnie goes back and he's, he's basically talking to Roberto Sparrow. So now this is all just a flashback. Okay. They're rewinding time. Everybody's rewinding and going back in time and stuff. And he wrote this letter and here's what his letter says to, to Roberto Sparrow. She, he says, dear Roberto Sparrow. And then he sh it shows her up there. 
Notice how she's on the top of her house and it's all green and stuff, right? I've reached the end of your book and I can only hope that the answers will come to me in my sleep. That means when we're dreaming, right? The Bible has a prophecy that talks about what happens in the last days during the end times. It says that people will start dreaming dreams and having visions of things, right? Everybody, many people will all collectively, all together, starting to dream similar, if not the exact same things. It's just that they don't know about it. They don't know what's happening because how many people, how many, how often do people talk about their dreams, right? How many people can remember their dreams, but how often do people share their dreams with one another so much that they're like, oh my God, I had the exact same dream. I'll bet you if you started sharing all your dreams on a public platform that other people are going to start liking it and saying, oh my God, I had that exact same dream, et cetera. And collectively, they're like little puzzle pieces that are showing you the future, showing you things that are to happen. Uh, the answers will come to me in my sleep. Sometimes I'm afraid that you'll tell me that this is not a work of fiction. So let's pretend like that's not Donnie Darko talking. Let's pretend like that's me talking about this movie. Sometimes I'm afraid that you'll tell me that this is not a work of fiction. I think that that's true and rings true with a lot of people when it comes to fiction and movies and TV and stuff, that they're terribly afraid that it's going to come true, that it's not fiction, that it's actually based on and has substance in reality. Or like REM says, um, what if all these fantasies come flailing around, right? He says, I hope that when the world comes to an end, I can breathe a sigh of relief because there will be so much to look forward to. And then it shows you the little plasma hole. And then he cracks up. He starts busting. He goes back to his bed. Okay. After, after all this happened, he goes back to his bed and he stays there. And as he's on his bed, all of a sudden we're transported to the very beginning of the film when that jet engine is about to land on him. But instead of him getting up and listening to Frank and sleepwalking to his freedom and then thus living in a cr corrupt base world, he's going to stay in bed as a sacrifice. You see that? Donnie Darko is going to sacrifice himself for the betterment of mankind to change all of that negativity because him dying is going to actually have a butterfly effect or a chaos effect on all of these negative things that I've shown you all throughout this movie. <laughs> Pardon me. All right. So he starts laughing, which also is a sign of the apocalypse with the nitrous oxide clouds that are formed as well. People start laughing uncontrollably, basically. Um, but he starts cracking up. He feels so much better about everything. He turns around, puts the covers on himself. And that's when the jet engine crashes right through his bed, crushing Donnie Darko. Now check this out. He's gone. The next thing it shows you is every single character in the movie waking up from a dream. First, his therapist wakes up and you can tell she's thinking about the entire movie that just played out because she just dreamed it. Everything you just watched was in her dream. Loredana. Hey, welcome. Welcome. Good to see you. So shows her, right? And then it goes to his science teacher and he's like, clearly he just woke up and he's deep and thought about something. So it's, it's basically implied that he just woke up from a very similar dream, right? And then it shows you, uh, it's hard to see him, but this is Jim Cunningham. He woke up crying <laughs> as well. He should, right? He woke up crying and he's just, he's, it's implied that it was shown to him. What you and I just watched happened to him. So he's crying. I don't know if he's crying because he feels bad about what he did or because he dreamed that he got caught doing it. Either way, it's implied that, that he feels bad and that he's you know, hopefully repentant or something right? like that. And then it shows, uh, oh, this is the girl who is in, this is like the, the teacher that was like, you know, you, you, you do what we say, you're going to get a zero. This is the girl that that uh, nobody was watching or whatever. She doesn't look too concerned actually. So maybe things are going to get better for her. This is the guy who dressed up as Frank. So it shows him actually drawing the Frank costume because he's getting ready for Halloween. And he was up late at night in the middle of the night. And all of a sudden he like reaches up to his eye and he's like touching his eye exactly where Donnie was stabbing, exactly where he got shot. Because all of these people dreamed Donnie Darko, the movie. All of these people dreamed an alternate reality that actually did happen 
but now everything has changed. So, did it actually happen to them? Possibly. Another theory is that there are alternate Earths, like I was talking about, right? And we have a connection to all of those alternate us's on all of those alternate realms and planes of existence, and that we can tap in to those events, those alternate memories or events that have happened where things happen slightly different. And then REM is actually playing in the background. Um, and uh, it's called Mad World, right? And at the end, he says, happy birthday, happy birthday. And then it shows you Frank's mask. Happy birthday. That's exactly how this movie should end. As we've talked about many times, Oftentimes, the apocalypse is symbolically portrayed as happening on somebody's birthday, usually a savior figure, a god type of a figure, a hero of old. Uh, and then you see Gretchen. She's alive and well because we're right back to the beginning of the movie when that jet engine had fallen on Donnie Darko. So she's alive and it goes, mad world. That's what this movie's about. It's about the world being crazy. Mad as an angry, yes, because the vibes are mad or angry, negative, negatively charged. Um, and it's also mad means crazy, or it used to mean crazy, right? They Like uh, the Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland, he says, we're all mad here. Or I don't know. I guess that's in a Mandela effect now, but he used to say that. Maybe in another alternate realm, an alternate earth. I know he said that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, mad world, that's what it's all about. So good news is it's going to change. Balance will be restored, I promise you. The movies are telling this to us. I'm telling this to my to you. I've dreamed about it. I've seen it. I know it. It is a law of the universe that balance will be restored. Right now, we are imbalanced, okay? The scales will tip. We will enter back into a golden age, and things will change for the better. So the moral of the story is hang on, okay? Hang on, endure, get through the hard times, because just like Donnie Darko's teacher said, you know, we need the darkness in order to, we need to go through that darkness in order to be better, basically, as a part of our growth. And it says, I promise that one day everything's going to be better for you, which was advice that was given to Donnie Darko. And that is our movie. So, hey. Happy Halloween if you celebrate that type of thing. Happy All Hallows Eve. I hope you'll go check out the last few videos I did, especially the, uh, I mean, they're all pretty good, but um, the Blob one was pretty awesome. I had fun doing that. Donnie Darko was amazing. I've loved this entire thing. I'm probably going to watch this whole live stream again. I I definitely want to see what everyone's saying in the chat because I, I want to be a part of it too. Um, and I'm going to wish you guys a, a good rest of your night. Let's run the credits. Until next time, I'm Jay Dreamer saying good vibes. And goodbye.
vast multiples. Thank you.